Hello friends. Welcome to the Revenger What If. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto is transported to Marvel Universe and fell in love with Jessica Jones. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video. This was so stupid, stupid and confusing. What had gotten into that old pervert's head? Not only did his training suck, but I kept summoning tadpoles and he just told me, try harder, the nerve. But this day started even stranger and it only got weirder and weirder as time dragged on. Now the old pervert was standing in front of me and asking stupid questions. I couldn't take it any longer, I just had to ask. Wah! Pain! He hit me in the gut, it hurts, my stomach, blacking out. As soon as I regained consciousness I immediately jumped to my feet and saw that the pervert was leaning over him, face set in stone. Why did you? I was about to shout when his voice cut me like a knife. Training ends here, if you want to live then figure it out yourself. He said as he poked me in the forehead and I felt my legs lose contact with the ground as I flew back and down into a ing gorge. As I few I knew. I knew that I would die if I didn't do anything. I did not want to die, I wanted to live, I wanted to live, that is when it happened, for a fraction of a second time slowed down to a complete stop and everything turned black. Next thing I knew I wake up in a sewer, in a sewer. But that would mean, I started walking, I did not know where but my legs instinctively lead me in one specific direction. It was very easy to realize just where I was as a giant cage loomed over me the moment I entered one of the rooms, it had taken me several minutes to reach this place and now I was finally here. What do you want mortal? I couldn't help but flinch as the echo of the words hit me but I would have to be strong, brave, if only for a minute. I am here for your power fox, I shouted defiantly, attempting to hide my fear. And why would I give my power to you? What would I gain? I guess it worked huh? Let me put it this way fox, if you don't give me power, both of us will die, come on, come on, please work. Heh, 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 I like you boy, you have guts, to stand in front of me and demand something from me. Fine, you can have as much as you like. I was just about ready to piss myself when the bastard grinned at me. By Kami he could probably swallow one of the heads of the Hokage monument in one bite. Red demonic chakra crawled from the depths of the fox's cage and quickly enveloped me. It burned and as I looked at the damn flea bag I saw his, its, eyes widen as if he had realized something. Then he burst out laughing. Ah ha 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 ha. Boy. Ha 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 let me tell you this. The universe either smiles upon you, or curses you for an eternity. See you on the other side. Oh and boy, be prepared for a whole world of pain. Ah ha ha ha. He kept laughing as I felt more and more of his power surge from the cage. What have I done? I just gave him control. As I snapped my eyes open, the least thing I saw was that my body was paralyzed, incased in a red cocoon of demonic energy. That in the bottom of the gorge and the circular crystal formation that was hidden in the water, which had just started glowing red as well. The moment I touched the water, I felt pain so much pain. Air. I need air. The ice cold water sizzled as it evaporated, if I wasn't in such chilly water I'm sure my skin would have caught fire by now but the fact that my skin hadn't melted of my muscles didn't help the fact that my blood was literally boiling my internal organs. How did I end down here anyway? I don't remember jumping into the lake. I focus myself onto the one task that really matters at the moment. Getting out of the water before I suffocate. My efforts were soon rewarded by fresh cold air that cut to my lungs like a cold knife but I didn't care, I'm sure that there wasn't much left of it anyway, my blood was still boiling me alive and the steam that came out of my mouth, ears and nose along with the blood only proved it. I am so tired, I just want to close my eyes and hope the pain goes away, but I can't stop, the shore is just several feet away though at the moment it felt like several miles. I dragged myself to the edge of the water and grasped at the snow in an attempt to dig my fingers into the hard ground and pull myself out. That was, too easy, I rolled over on my back and weakly raised my left hand to my face. Was it natural to have claws? They weren't much but really, wait a second, what am I? Shouldn't I have a name? Erg? Pain? This time in my head, flashes, pictures but, I can't grasp them, I can't recall them long enough, it hurts so much. Grr. I looked up and the last thing I saw a very large, clawed paw descending on my face before everything went black. Are you sure the power surge came from this sector? The man who said that was wearing very thick grey clothes which worked wonders in the cold weather of the Canadian wilderness. 
Not really, the eggheads just gave us a general area for us to search. Do you see anything with the binoculars? Nope, everything's white. Hold on, let me switch to heat seeking mode. And, there by the lake, I found something. Wow, that thing is white hot. For real? What does it look like? It looks like a small body, a child's body, more likely. Come on, let's establish visual. Roger. The two heavily equipped and armed men jogged down the small hill they were using as an observation point to scan for their target and got within a dozen meters of the small body that was emitting lots of heat. Whoa, poor kid, a bear must have gotten to him, one of the men muttered as he gazed at the mutilated, disemboweled and half-eaten corpse of what looked like a twelve-year-old boy. Something ain't right man, I saw on the heat vision that he was white hot, still is. Oh my sweet lord exclaimed the second man as he and his partner watched stunned as the boy's internal organs regrew back into place as the bones of his ribcage knitted themselves tighter and after the muscle and skin regenerated the boy looked just a bit messed up but ultimately fine all in the span of less than a minute did you just see that exclaimed the man with the binoculars i sure did oh man we gotta let dr rice know about this now said the other man as he took out a radio and flipped it on base this is Thompson reporting, we found the source and boy will Dr. Rice be salivating when he sees him, over. Roger that, Chopper will be at your location ETA 5 to 10 minutes, over. Roger that base, Thompson out. He turned T off and pocketed it as he moved a little closer to the unconscious boy to take a better look at him. You think he's a mutie? I mean the eggheads cloned one of them that heals real fast. Yeah I know about the little monster. Whoa, check out the Tatman exclaimed the second man as strange symbol appeared on the skin of the boy's stomach. It looked like a big swirl with two lines, on the top and bottom of the spiral that had four protrusions each, it didn't look like anything to them and they were real freaked by it since it just sort of appeared on the kid's skin from nothing. Man I can't wait for the ink chopper, this kid is freaking me out by the second and he's out cold too. I hear that, medical journal, Dr. Xander Rice. The new subject that the security guards brought in last week has turned out to be quite a puzzle. At first we thought that he was a mutant similar to the original Weapon X but we were proven wrong as several experiments showed that the he has an advanced regenerative factor, I am saying regenerative and not healing because it is what it looks like, the subject's injuries seem to knit themselves together at an astonishing rate much higher than that of Weapon X. Those who read this may find it amusing but the closest comparison to the level of cellular regeneration would be the T-1000. And I may not be far from the truth as molecular scans of his DNA and cell structure yielded unusual energy readings which could mean many things though I theorize that the subject's body is not completely corporeal thought it is still only a theory. After I brought my findings to project head Martin Sutter he has authorized me to begin work into molding the new subject into another living weapon to partner with our current project X-23 who is doing exceptionally well, especially with the trigger scent though that will take a lot more time to finish. My estimates are eight months to a year. Xander Rice finished typing, got up from his chair and walked briskly through the hallways that would lead him to the room where his new project had just awakened. The news had arrived just before he had finished writing and he could not wait to begin work. As soon as he reached the lab he saw thought the one-way glass that his new subject was laying peacefully on the bed he was strapped to as his eyes darted to and fro before they focused solely on him as he opened the door. Hey there, do you have a name? He decided to be a little diplomatic in his first meeting with the boy, though the chance was slim he could probably learn something more about him if he acted a little civilly. Said boy just looked at him blankly and spoke in a clear voice, Who are you? Rice frowned as he realized that boy had just spoken flawless Japanese, not something many who had studied the language could do, there would always be an accent that was reminiscent of his or hers first language. My name is Rice Xander and you are in a hospital, he lied flawlessly. And what is yours? I come I, don't know, I see, Rice nodded to himself as he chatted with the boy for several minutes in which he learned absolutely, nothing, it would seem that whatever had happened to the boy had caused him amnesia. How, unfortunate. He had just opened the door to exit the room when he saw Kimura, another one of his projects appear at the doorway, quickly drawing her gun and firing past his ear. It took him several seconds for the shell shock to fade and he to realize that the boy who was, supposedly, strapped quite tightly to a table was about to pounce him from behind when Kimura had shot him in the collarbone. I was going to ask about the new training program you've got planned for the little clone when I see you almost get jumped by the brat so I just couldn't help myself. Who is he anyway? 
questioned the cold-hearted handler as she approached the downed boy and kicked him in the head making him yelp in pain. He is to be my newest project, apparently he can regenerate at a higher rate than Weapon X and X-23. Though he seems to have problems with making friends. Smiling cruelly Rice took great pleasure in watching Kimura pummel the boy the moment he said the word regenerate. Want me to teach him the pecking order around here boss? She asked as she grinned when one of the boy's ribs broke under the pressure of her kicks and blood gushed out his mouth. Electrocution was what I was thinking, one very long session if you will. That and a lot more beating. Smiling at her rice exited the room from which more of the young boy's pain-filled wails came from. Well Xander, it's been three months since your newest project was given then green light, what are the results so far? Questioned Martin Sutter, project head of the base. As you know the subject has suffered amnesia and our information brokers have found nothing on him or anyone that has similar to his abilities or characteristics so his past is a mystery. Now, unlike before, he is quiet and obedient though it took several sessions with Kimura to get the facts through his head. I believe we have successfully broken him sir, explained Xander Rice with a smile. Good, please continue. Yes well, it would seem that before he lost his memories he received extensive training in martial arts. At the moment he is doing them on pure instincts though it is nothing too advanced he is being refined as we speak. He is a surprisingly fast learner if the conditions are right. Rice chuckled. I hope you haven't been torturing him too badly, I need a weapon, not a nervous wreck. Now tell me, what upgrade are you planning for him? Sutter propped his elbows on his desk and crossed his arms, leaning his chin on them. Something that could not have been done on X-23, tell me have you watched the Predator? Asked Rice as he took a metal box out from his jacket and handed it to Sutter who took it and with a raised eyebrow opened the box and smiled at what he saw. One perfect pair of the jagged, scary looking wrist blades that the, the Predator used were laying in the small rectangular box. For now they just made from steel but if the experiment proves successful we will cover them with adamantium, we are also designing a hook blade that will extend perpendicularly under them and will be able to rotate at a full 360 degrees due to several pieces of tech stolen from Stark Enterprises. Finished Rice with a smile matched by his superior. When do you plan to implant them? I'm not particularly in a hurry, not until Kimura gives the green light that he is as obedient as a drone. Good, how is X-23 progressing? Her combat training is progressing steadily, but she still needs time for her trail run. I'd say maybe six to seven months. Good, good. Crack. What is the point? There is no hope of escape. Every time I try to escape she is always there to stop me. Crack. It hurts so much. I hope she doesn't cut one of my hands again, it regrows but it still hurts so much. Will you try to run any more shit stain? She likes taunting me, she takes great pleasure in seeing me in paint. I so much want to jump up and twist her neck. Like that will ever happen, I quickly shook my head before she strikes me again and coughed up a little blood. The last rib she broke got lodged in my lung, it will heal, still hurts though. Good, now be nice and don't attack any more personnel while I check on the little clone, if you do, I'll cut off all four of your limbs. I winced as I knew she would fulfill her treat and take great pleasure in it. Oh come now, why the scared face? You're not afraid of a little pain are you? She continued to taunt me as she kicked me in the gut one final time. Dr. Kinney will be here soon to resume your studies so I want you on your best behavior shitstain. She called out after her shoulder before she slammed the door to my cell shut. I smiled. Of all the people I have seen here so far, Dr. Kinney is the kindest one. She's so nice to me all the time and she actually praises me, her and Sensei, he is strict but kind. Though what bothers me is who are all three talking about. Who is this clone that Kimura always sneers about? Is she the same girl Dr. Kinney and Sensei sometimes refer to? X-23, wasn't it how Dr. Kinney once called her? Another one like me. One month later. So Xander, is he ready? Martin Sutter was currently standing in front of a large window that revealed a large circular room several meters under it. At the moment the large room was empty save for one blonde haired, blue eyed boy with whisker marks on his cheeks who was standing a little way to the center in some black spandex clothes. More than enough to handle the current test, okay bring it up. Assured Xander Rice as he gave the command to a man who sitting in front of a computer who tipped something on his keyboard and the floor a dozen feet from the boy parted and a cage was lifted which contained a wolf who had several mechanical implants surgically integrated with the wolf's back. 
A second later the cage opened and some sort of liquid flowed through a see-through rubber tube from the mechanical device on its back to somewhere in the back of its skull. The effects were instantaneous as the wolf howled in rage and lunged itself at the blonde who quickly jumped back so far that he hit the wall behind him and to the shock of everyone observing. Stuck to it, but before anyone could utter a single word the boy's entire visage took upon a metamorphosis as his sapphire blue eyes turned a bloody red, glowing color and his teeth and nails elongated even further, before they were much buggier and sharper than a normal human's, now they choppers and claws respectfully. Jumping lightly from the wall he fell in a crouch and began to use both his hands and feet to move closer as he and the enraged wolf began to circle each other slowly. Look at him Xander, he's a beast, a demon, exclaimed Sudden with glee, but why hasn't he showed such behavior towards Kimura? Who knows? Maybe he instinctively knows that Kimura is stronger and therefore superior to him, or it could be any number of things, x23 acts similarly. She as well has given up on resisting Kimura because she can't harm her. She, he was cut off when both his subject and the enhanced wolf lunged with only murder on their minds. The fight was short and brutal as the blonde boy allowed the wolf to latch onto his collarbone as he used both his hands to gut the poor creature then dismember it in his rage. After his little temper tantrum was over the boy just stood up and stared blankly at the mass of flesh and bones that the surgically enhanced wolf now resembled as his wound completely closed itself all had happened in less than 20 seconds. He is perfect, and to think we will only be improving on that, whispered Sutter. Imagine the possibilities after he undergoes the operation, said Rice. He will be unstoppable. Indeed, and I have just the perfect codename for him, DX, Demon X. Snicked. They did another experiment without anesthetic or whatever one of the doctors called it, Dr. Kinney said it dulled pain. I really wanted those anesthetics, snicked. Another two months had passed since they first, tested me. There had been several more tests after that one which I passed as well. Snicked. Is this supposed to be a prize or something? Do they think I am good enough to be given these weapons, or do they think I am too weak and I need these things to help me? Snicked. The blonde was staring with great interest at his newest acquisition. Given the speed at which he regenerated the sergeants gave up on using conventional methods and instead programmed the entire operation into a robot that simply drilled right through his flash and bone and forcefully implanted the metal claws into the boy's forearms. The boy was in unimaginable pain. Now he had two pairs of double claws that exit between the knuckles of his index and middle finger, and his ring finger and pinky. But that was not all, nestled between the two wrist blades was another hook-like blade. Though it had the same jagged design as the other two, this one was curved forward and resembled one mean looking mini scythe. Snicked. Knowing his, what were they even to him? He knew that Kimura was his handler, but what would the others be? His masters. Most likely, so knowing that his master would surely test him again, he decided to get a feel for the pain. Snicked. Maybe if he did it for a long enough time, the pain would dull to only a twinge in the back of his mind but until then, snicked. This was the worst punishment to date. I knew it was foolish, I shouldn't have done it but, there was this small glimmer of hope, was, not anymore, I had once again attacked her when she wasn't looking and had caught her by surprise but it ultimately ended in failure. My punishment, I want to cry every time I think about it. She had decided to test the limits of my healing factor and had hanged me by my wrists on a chain but not before she had stripped me. She started with my feet, pouring kerosene on them then lighting them on fire, then my things, my waist, my torso and finally my head and arms. Each time when she moved up she poured some extra so she could cover all that she had previously burned and was patient enough to wait for my healing factor to regenerate my skin before she pulled a match. It hurt so much, especially when my eyes melted inside my skull. That had to be the worse. Suffice to say, I never tried to escape again. Not for a long time at least. Several months later. So tell me Xander, how did the bonding process go? Asked Sutton as he read through some documents that were laying on his desk. Perfect and there hasn't been any incidents involving DX ever since that particularly harsh punishment Kimura dished out. Don't you think she went a bit overboard with that one? Sutton looked up from the paper he was reading to look at Rice with a raised eyebrow. We were wondering how to test the limit of his healing factor anyway and she was careful not to go too overboard and endanger the subject. That is good to hear, how long do you estimate before we can field test him? I already have X-23's first target that will introduce her to our clientele. 
said Sutton as he took a photograph and handed it to Rice. Ah, presidential candidate Greg Johnson, a good choice, high profile indeed, but are you sure it is wise to leak out the info that someone is planning to assassinate him? For all we know S.H.I.E.L.D. or even the Avengers could be there? Rice asked with a smile as he flipped through Greg Johnson's folder. Oh I'm sure she will do just fine, of course. Rice kept smiling even as he exited Sutton's office. When are you planning to introduce DX to X-23? Asked Dr. Sarah Kinney as she watched DX during his firearms practice. I was thinking after we field test him, then maybe giving them tandem training so they could become used to each other, said Sutton smiling. Speaking of his field test, said Rice as he just had entered the observation room, I've picked up the perfect target. He handed a folder to Sutton who began flipping through it. Several senators will be throwing a gala in Congressman Hudson's villa on the coast of Upper State New York. Families, security and staff over 200 people all in all. Finished Rice as he crossed his arms over his chest. Reading the files for several more minutes Sutton nodded slowly several times. Do it. Was all he said as he returned the folder to Rice and turned back to watch as DX peppered his target with automatic fire from a standard M16. Several hours later DX was taken out of his cell and escorted under heavy guard to an armory where he was outfitted with his mission clothes. A pair of black spandex pants and a shirt that only covered to his biceps was what he was going to wear along with a pair of knee-high boots that looked slightly bulky. In addition he was given a full set of minor gadgets that he had been thought to use. He had been briefed on the mission before head so all that was left to get going. Several hours later, after using a jet to get from Canada to New York DX and his handling team had boarded a chopped from their base in the state of NY and were now two miles from the target building. Listen up, from the moment we drop you off to the moment we hightail out of here you have exactly one hour. If you're late even one second we're dusting off without you, got it? Explained the commander as he handed the blonde teen a watch that showed exactly one hour. Looking up at him. DX nodded and strapped the offered watch to his left wrist while donning a pair of goggles which had two little, round, red glowing lenses that would be showing everything the soldier of the 21st century would need to see, from tactical data to infrared, night and heat vision to a tactical 3D map of the target area. They had it all. The chopper reached the landing point in several minutes which was only about a mile away from the target building, any closer and the security might be tipped off, ruining the entire operation before it began. The pilot lowered the aircraft and landed smoothly, not a second later DX shot out through the passenger compartment and dashed through the night. The mansion was obviously a summer retreat due to the lack of security that would normally be present on such a big event meaning that infiltrating the mansion would come down to sneaking past several bored private security guards. No challenge. Crawling up the wall to the second floor he climbed through one of the windows after he easily cut the glass with one of his claws. Once in. He stealthily moved through the corridors of the second floor heading for the security center of the house. Pressing his back to the wall he walked slowly down the dark corridors before he froze in place as a door opened directly in front of him and a boy roughly around his age, though slightly younger exited a room. Thinking quickly and ruthlessly he pounced the younger child who was unable to resist him resulting in both of them falling to the ground back into the room. Grabbing the sides of his head, DX snapped the boy's neck with one quick movement. Jumping to his feet he slammed the door behind him and looked up to see that at least another dozen kids around his age and younger were staring at him with wide eyes. DX contemplated his next course of action for only a second before he stood straight and let his arms dangle at his sides, snicked. Did you hear something? asked a blonde well-built man dressed in a tuxedo as he glanced at the ceiling. Bah, it's just the kids having fun Steve, ah, when we were young laughed a much older and rounder man with pudgy face but was cut off by the first. We were stupid. I still can't believe sixty years passed like that Congressman Hudson. For God's sake Steve, it's Sam. We're friends, old war vets and we call each other by our first names. Of course Sam, I guess it just slipped, you know me. He chuckled along his old wartime comrade and friend. But of course, Captain America, the image of etiquette and good behavior. Tell me. Will any of your friends from the Avengers be joining us tonight? Questioned the older looking of the two. Tony will be arriving in about half an hour or less, but the others had work and other responsibilities, you understand, I'm sure. Answered Steve Rogers, Captain America, with a small smile. I'm really grateful that you came, Steve, it means a lot, said Hudson in a quiet voice. 
Anytime Sam and, there is a secondary reason for my attendance, replied Steve in an equally quiet voice as he took another sip of his champagne. Yes, Greg was a good man, he would have made a great president, but before he could continue the power went off without any warning making some people panic. Stay here Sam. I'll check with the security guards on the second floor. Said Steve as he used the little moonlight available to climb the stairs to the second floor. Once there he walked to the opposite end of the large mansion and knocked on door where the security center was located once he reached it. No answer, strange, he knocked again and still no answer. Knitting his eyebrows he grabbed the handle and twisted it only to find it jammed. Frowning he quickly took a step backwards and hurled himself at the door which gave way under his super strength. Shock quickly took over Steve Rogers as he stared wide-eyed at the corpses of the security guards strewn across the floor, four people, each with his throat cut open. Taking a step backwards, Steve exited the dark room and found himself back into the moonlight-lit hallway and then screaming began. A second later he was running at top speed down the corridors. Pushing himself to his limit, Steve drove shoulder first into the door and rode down the staircase into the dark room which by now was, much to Steve's fear, deathly silent, bodies strewn across the expensive carpets, all was quiet before a woman's scream pierced the darkness from an adjacent room until it was silenced a second later. Snapping himself out of the macabre trance he had entered, Captain America sprinted out of the room nearly tripping on several occasions into a body before he entered a corridor and caught a glimpse of someone's foot around a corner. Sprinting even faster, Steve rounded the same corner and ran down another hallway after a small figure that just crashed through a window followed closely by the Avenger. Giving chase through the backyard of the mansion, his sharp eyes snapped to the side for just a moment before Steve concentrated and threw himself in a row, grabbing a round river stone that was part of the garden's decoration and hurled it at the mystery assassin the moment he rolled to a crouch. The egg-like stone flew through the air and impacted squarely with the back of the assassin's head making him fall forward into a roll and a 180 turn that allowed Steve to see the face of the mystery assassin for the first time. And when he saw it, he couldn't help but gasp as he gazed at the still roundish face. Just a kid, he mumbled as he watched the preteen stand up, knees bent and, spread and the older man was sure that he was glaring at him from under the goggles that covered half his face. Snicked. Steve couldn't believe his eyes when two pairs of very, very mean looking claws extend from the boy's knuckles. Just like her, he mumbled again as the boy launched himself at the captain who quickly snapped into action as well by ducking the double slash and delivering a shoulder tackle to the gut making both of them fall to the ground with the older blonde pinning the younger with his body and strength. Who sent you? shouted Captain America as rage was etched on his face which quickly turned into shock when the boy's knee was embedded in his groin. Pushing the advantage, the boy was able to roll from under the older man and get back into a fighting position just as Steve jumped into a crouch, one hand still holding his private area. Not wasting any more time, the boy rushed again and slashed with vigor though it was obvious that the older man was faster the young assassin but by only a little for if Steve was just a moment slower he would have been cut real bad and he had no illusion that if someone made a copy of his friend and teammate Wolverine that they wouldn't give him the signature adamantium claws. Rushing again, the boy slashed at Steve who ducked making a big mistake as the boy jumped with one foot on his knee and spun backwards delivering a strong kick for his age to the older Mon's chin. Stumbling back Steve flipped back to his feet just in time to catch both the child's arms which he crossed at his wrists while he lifted him in the air. Brining the boy only inches from his face Captain America was about to say something when the skin between thumb and index finger was cut to the bone as a pair of scythe-like claws jutted out of the boy's wrists forcing the Avenger to release him resulting in a drop kick to the solar plexus, driving the air from Steve's lungs and making him fall to the ground again. This time however before he could defend himself a trio of gunshots thundered out of the security guard's gun and nailed the boy in the shoulder collarbone and right lung making him lurch backwards before the preteen spun on his foot and took of in a sprint. Not so fast pipsqueak, roared a green-skinned woman as she rushed past the still-downed Captain America. Steve. Are you alright? shouted Tony Stark as he sprinted across the grass to help his downed friend. All live. Dot did you have to shoot him? I didn't shoot him Steve and by the look of things there wasn't any alternative, who is that boy? questioned the Iron Man as he helped the blonde man to his feet. The one who is responsible for the massacre, said Steve with a monotone voice. What? exclaimed Tony. He killed all these people. Are there any survivors Tony? 
No Steve, I'm sorry. He hacked into the security network and initiated a security lockdown, bearing all the doors before the killed the power. I, see. Was the only thing that Steve Rogers could say as he mentally beat himself for another failure he had allowed to occur on his watch. Do you think there is a connection between this and Johnson's murder? No, I'm certain of it. Stop right now, bellowed she hulk as she continued to chase me through the woods to the extraction point. The moment I was shot and forced to flee the scene I had radioed the chop to start up, I had lost count of the time and it is just now that I realize that I have less than a minute to go and one of the Avengers is chasing, no gaining on me fast. I don't think I'll make it. You have less than 30 seconds dx, we are hovering over the cliff, you'll have to make a running jump. I didn't answer, I didn't dare to. Had I told them that she hulk was on my tail they would have been miles away by now. This is your last warning. If you stop now I won't beat the crap out of you when I catch you. Must run faster, must run faster, must run faster, must, run, faster. Unknown to DX as he was chanting in his mantra in his head, his body had began to glow with a slight red light as wisps of pure energy began to gather around his feet. Jennifer Walters aka she hulk was a bit freaked out by this, although she didn't lack confidence in the fact that she would not only catch the boy but subdue him, she couldn't help but be a tiny bit nervous since the first time she saw the boy was when he was about to deliver a finishing blow on her fellow Avenger Captain Freak in America and his claws reminded her of Wolverine which was enough to make her nervous to begin with. So yeah, she was cautious and now just a little worried. At that moment the two runners exited the small forest surrounding the mansion and entered a small field that ended at a vertical drop cliff that ended in the waters below and off the edge of that vertical drop hovered a chopper. Shit. Thought Jennifer as she pushed everything she got into her legs in an attempt to catch the boy. From the moment he saw her he just knew that they would get along, it was like, instant chemistry, they were both prodigies at what they were thought to do. Killing people. And yet he liked X-23. He enjoyed her company and he was sure that the feeling was mutual and the feeling was, nice. It had been a year since the facility started sending them on missions, whether solo or the two of them together and they had spent almost every moment outside their cells in each other's company. His moment of reminiscence however cost him and he was quickly flipping backwards as a kick curtsy of the younger, raven-haired girl caught him under the chin. Using the backwards momentum of the blow he flipped three times and landed in a crouch. Slowly the corners of his mouth twitched upwards, the same smile could be seen on X-23's face as well as they both leapt into action once more. While the now ten-year-old girl was more flexible and agile due to her lithe form, speed, power and lighting fast reactions went to him so it wasn't much of a battle to see who was better since that was obvious, it was rather more of their way of having fun. In a room overlooking the one in which the two children were training stood a woman with raven black hair, emerald green eyed and features not too dissimilar from the young girl that was just caught in midair and pinned to the mat. Dr. Sarah Kinney watched fondly with a smile as the two kids enjoyed each other's company. Though it still pained her that the meaning of fun for the kids was fighting each other it was still something. Her smile however quickly turned into a frown as Xander Rice. Surgical head of Project X-23 and head of Project DX strode into the training dojo and called both living weapons to his side. She knew very well what that meant. The target was too high profile for one of the two to be able to complete it within the given parameters. Translation. There would be too many people to kill to be certain that only one will be able to silence them fast enough. Hence both of them would be sent, with a discount even. Two years later. I don't understand what happened, more like. I don't understand why I did what I did. A couple of days ago Kimura punished X-23 in front of me because she failed a mission. I had been brought out to meet a supposed intruder when she staggered into the base, her clothes full of bullet holes. She taunted her in front of everyone but it was the moment she struck her in the face something happened, this was the first time I had seen Kimura actually strike X-23, she gloated about it lots of times but to see it, I just, I just, snapped. I'm sure that currently they were debating whether or not to put me down permanently after I went berserk like that. I had charged Kimura with a burst of speed so fast that when I slammed her into the steel wall she slumped over my shoulder unconscious from the impact. Her skin may be indestructible but her insides weren't, she probably had a concussion due to the impact of her brain with her skull but I didn't care, the order to shoot had been given and there was no going back anymore. The more I fought on the more I became faster, stronger, tougher. I was a blur as I pounced the security guards and ripped them to shreds with my claws. 
Bullets were having a hard time penetrating my skin and those that did were usually at point blank and were quickly pushed back out as I continued to cut a swath through my opponents. After only a couple of minutes there was only silence as I observed the red-orange flames that surrounded me begin to disappear, though they weren't like real flames, these flames were more, ethereal and they weren't harming me in any way though I did feel very warm. Once they had disappeared I walked towards X-23 and offered her my hand which she took and stood up next to me. Still holding her hand I stood there at the spot, wondering what I should do. Less than a minute later Dr. Kinney entered the large hangar and beckoned us to come to her. I looked down into X-23's eyes and nodded to her. That was three days ago and currently I'm wondering when Kimura will arrive to punish me. He shitstain. Speaking of her, guess what I got? The large 90 liter barrel she rolled behind her reed, kerosene, I grit my teeth as hard as possible when she used a small pump to spray me from head to toe. I am gonna enjoy every ing second of this. She took a matchstick and lit it. Not this time, I won't scream for her this time, she can burn me as long as she wants but I will not give her that pleasure. X-23 was very confused. She could not make heads or tails of the events of the past week. She could not understand why had DX attacked Kimura and killed all the security officers. She was obviously the trigger since he went berserk seconds after Kimura struck her in an attempt to punish her for her failure. But why had he done it? Also why had Dr. Kinney taken her to San Francisco to search for that girl, Megan, Dr. Kinney's niece, and Rice? Why had he ordered her to assassinate the project head and his family and why, why had she spared the boy? Although she didn't show it, X-23 was very, very confused and the more she thought about it, the more questions popped up and led her further away from the answers. But she knew one thing and that was that she needed to be ready for anything, she had to be alert, ready to jump into action at a moment's notice, she just had this feeling, and yet, she couldn't stop thinking about what DX had done, he had defended her, that much she knew, but what was this feeling she got when her thoughts drifted to him? She felt confusion towards his actions and wonder to his current predicament but most of all worry to his well-being. Was that it? Was she concerned for him? Suddenly something very familiar happened as a sealed envelope slipped under the door's opening. Sarah Kinney was running as fast as her legs could hold her as she descended another fleet of stairs that lead to the most secure holding cells in the facility. Once down the room she was looking for was just a few meters away and she quickly began to dial the release code. Once the door snapped open with a hiss she choked on the stagnated and putrid smell of burned flash. Swallowing the bile that had climbed in her mouth she ran to the chained and shackled boy that was hanging of the ceiling, his wrists obviously broken due to the constant strain of the 16-year-old teen's weight and all clothes that he once wore were burned off leaving him naked as his flesh was a bright pink color indicating the strain that had been put on his healing powers. Quickly lowering him to the ground where he sat still, she took off his restraints, Sarah cupped his face, bringing it up so she can stare into his eyes. DX, can you hear me? She asked receiving a nod in return. I have a mission for you, she paused and he nodded again, indicating for her to continue. Your mission is to kill anyone you encounter within the facility, medical staff, security guards, everyone. If you are able, rendezvous with X-23 and assist her, your missions are the same. Are you with me so far? He nodded again as she helped him stand up. His healing factor had kicked in just several seconds ago and his skin had returned to its normal color. You have exactly 1300 minutes to accomplish your mission. Get out of the facility before the time is up or you will be caught in the blast wave of the bombs X-23 has set up. There is a pack of your clothes just outside. She was about to walk out when he grabbed her hand, stopping her. Turning around slowly she watched confused as he brought his closed right fist to his left hand and with one quick move of his claws he cut open the palm where he allowed some blood to pool up before he brought it up to Sarah's face and smeared it across her right cheek and hair. Wondering why he did that she was about to ask when he smiled at her while putting a finger to his mouth in a shush motion before tapping his nose several times and walking past her. It took Sarah only several seconds to understand what DX had done. Xander had touched the same spot of her face several hours ago before he relieved her of her duties. And now, she couldn't help but shudder at the thought of what Laura would do to her had DX not washed away the trigger scent, he had saved her life. The few guards that he encountered were nothing to him as he now typed away on one of the main computers in the facility. He always knew that an opportunity would arise that would allow him to escape, once he may have given up but that was before he realized that there was more to life than the metal walls experiments and torture they put him through. And who could blame him? 
Due to the severe amnesia he had suffered he didn't even know what 90% of the things around him were, heck the first time he was let out in the sun he had asked, what is that glowing thing? Now he had a mission, one which he would gladly accomplish, it was time for him to get some revenge and the data he was currently downloading would be his first step to accomplishing it, not only would he bring down the other facilities that the organization possessed but if he had the chance, he would kill every single one of their clients, every single one that had hired him to kill for them. He looked at his wristwatch and saw that he had about three minutes left, an escape plan already forming in his head. Kaboom! Sarah Kinney smiled as she watched both teens walk out of the front door of the building before it exploded in a spectacular ball of flames. She was overjoyed that this was over and quickly rushed to meet the duo that were halfway to her, though once she got close enough she raised an eyebrow at the fact that DX was carrying a body of one of the scientists over his shoulder and was about to ask him when he held up his hand and beckoned for her to follow him. DX, what are you doing? she asked. I have a plan that will ensure your escape. He simply said, follow me in a single line right behind me. Looking at him confused for a second Sarah decided to go with the blonde's plan and walked after X-23 right behind DX who was heading in the direction of the forest. Reaching the tree line he dumped the body next to the trunk of a tree and turned to the two females. This is as far as I go. You two will continue through the forest and then find a route to the nearest town while I stay here to cover your tracks and stall the search parties, he calmly explained. What? I'm not leaving you here DX, if you stay here they may capture you, exclaimed Sarah as she threw her arms at her sides. But you will be safe, better the two of you escape than risk all three of us being recaptured, if I stay here I will be able to buy you the time you need to put enough distance between here and you, he insisted as he out a bit more force into his voice. Conceding, Sarah took a step forward and gave him a hug which made him stiffen for a moment before returning it. Thank you. I will never forget what you did for me today. You're welcome. We may never see each other again, she continued as she released him. I know, he said quietly as she stepped in front of X-23 and after a moment looking her in the eyes he hugged her, which she gladly returned before he released her and said, goodbye. Laura, said Sarah as she cut him off mid-speech. That is her name. She smiled down at her daughter and laid a hand on her head making the girl look at her in wonder. What a beautiful name, goodbye Laura, I hope we meet again, he said as he stepped back, looking at him for several seconds, Laura smiled as well, I hope so too, was all that she said before she turned around, took her mother's hand and lead her through the woods and to their freedom. Looking at their retreating forms for several seconds he continued to smile before it disappeared from his face which went blank and emotionless before he turned to the lifeless body beside him. Snicked, his plan was simple. The scientist that he just mutilated would make people think that the man was running from someone who chased him down, hence why he asked the two women to walk right behind him. Nodding to himself, DX turned to his left and sprinted through the snow, creating a trail that lead away from the two escapees. Right on cue, he thought as he spotted a trio of choppers approaching. They would be on him in less than a minute. Snicked. At least he wouldn't need to wait. Ra ta 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 the sound of a machine gun echoed around the area as the soldiers attempted to slow me down, fools, I am in luck though. They had not been informed about just who the attacker was which gives me an advantage. Otherwise they would have probably been using tranquilizer darts to subdue me which is probably one of the few tactics they can employ that would actually work. She. One of them attempted to say before I decapitated him. Seconds later I plunged my claws into the torso of the last man of the six-man squad. That was the last one on the ground too, now for the choppers. Picking up a Macmillan TAC-50 sniper rifle which belonged to one of the men I gutted I took aim and shot one of the chopper pilots in the mouth, damn, I was aiming for the forehead. Shooting down the two other choppers by eliminating the pilots I was sure that it was over, until an arrow stuck itself in my right shoulder blade making me drop the sniper rifle. Well, well, well. You're looking better than the last time I saw you D, I should have smelled her, of course. The wind was in my way and with the amount of fuel burning and blood spilled there was little chance for me to smell her, damn. You've been a really bad boy DX and when I get you into your new cell, you would wish I set you on fire again, no more, no more will I listen to her taunts or suffer her torture. Kimura, I turned around and faced her, I could feel the rage flowing from me in waves. My power was steadily surrounding me in a cocoon of solid energy. I could clearly see the fear and uneasiness in her posture, her eyes 
and I just couldn't help but smile. Here, now, I am going to kill you. Peef, you tried that lots of times already, but I guess humiliating you one more time will be fun, as always. She retorted though I could still feel her fear, it was intoxicating. I waited for a couple of more seconds to gather enough energy that will make me feel very comfortable and leapt at her, claws ready to rend. She didn't block, perfect. I struck again and again but it was to no avail as her skin was indestructible even to adamantium. Crunch. And when she finally decided to retaliate she broke nose in one hit, figures, that didn't deter me though, the more the fight dragged on the more power I gathered, the energy that surrounded me acted like a shield and she knows it. She is good, we both are. Me and my healing powers and adamantium laced claws and she with her indestructible skin. We could go on like this for hours, days, if she had the stamina which she doesn't. There, she isn't fast enough to jump over my leg sweep neither does she have the strength to do it so she falls flat on her back and doesn't get up. Not so tough now are you Kimura? Taunting will only make me drop to her level, I know it, but honestly, it doesn't matter, we're both monsters and monsters are on the same level. UD, I may be down but you can't kill me, you know it, I can smell it, she's keeping a front on. We've been at it for hours now and there have been no reinforcements, the brass either doesn't know what's happening here or they're too afraid to come anywhere near me and she knows that too. No one will come to help her, she is all alone, with me. You know Kimura, when I first came here I didn't even know who I was, what I was, heck I didn't even know my name still don't but at least i found something about what i am you want to know a secret i'm someone who you should have never messed with the hell d's that mean shit stain you must finally be going retarded with all the headshots i gave you throughout the years she laughed loudly damn her even now that i am standing over her she continues to taunt me no matter it means that i will kill each and every one of the people who work for the main facility i will hunt you all down and murder you with my own hands and i've already started now hold still, this will hurt like a. I grinned at her as the energy surrounding me receded and gathered into the palm of my right hand as I knelt next to her as she began to struggle to no avail. What'd you do to me shitstain, what did you do to me? I let louse something that has been locked within me for a long time, only a tiny smidgen of it to keep you in place, can you feel it? The bloodlust? The fear? It leaves a bitter taste at the back of your mouth doesn't it? And this, I hovered my glowing hand over her face is something I have just recently learned. I smiled at her for one last time before I covered her face with my palm and applied pressure. Her screams were like music to my ears as my fingertips sunk under skin and muscle and gripped at her skull. Securing a tight hold over it I tugged back and in a flash of red light Kimura's skull, along with her lower jaw was gripped between my fingers. If you are still alive Kimura, I would just like to tell you that I do know what I am, I have been what you made me, a demon both figuratively and literally, that's right, I'm a regular hell spawn, now goodbye Kimura, oh and, I'll hold on to this for now, I held the skull above the mass of flesh that was her head and smiled. You don't mind do you, no, good, I stood up and walked away from her body, not caring if she was dead or alive, her bleach white skull secure under my arm. Though, should I return and finish her off, should I just keep walking, oh, a grenade, it must have fallen off her harness when we fought, how, convenient, die you ing, I gave in, doesn't matter, I stuffed the grenade down that s mouth and pulled the pin, chances are her skin will hold the blast in, making mush of her internal organs, goodbye Kimura, hope you rot in pieces, you deserve it, two and a half years later, New Year City, knock, 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 now who could that be, thought a raven haired, emerald eyed woman as she walked towards the front door of her flat, knock 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 yes yes who is it she questioned as she looked through the spyglass dr kinney it is me answered a voice from the hallway belonging to a young man with shoulder length blonde hair wearing goggles and dressed in black clothes oh my dx is that you sarah kinney quickly unlocked her front door and stood before the now grown-up figure smiling a small smile soon formed on the blonde as they both embraced each other oh god I thought I'd never see you again. How did you find us? She quickly asked as she released him and beckoned him inside. It wasn't easy. In fact, I got a lead on you only after I took out a branch of the facility in San Francisco. He answered as he took of the goggles he wore and stuffed them in his jacket. Yes, we had a rather unpleasant encounter with them there. My sister will probably never forgive me for that one. 
said Sarah as she hugged herself and lead the blonde inside the apartment's kitchen. But we were able to outsmart them. But wait, does that mean we've been compromised? She finished the last part with panic in her voice. No, he held up his hands in a soothing manner in an attempt to calm her down. You have not been compromised, the information I acquired was a list of known flights that have gone from San Francisco to other major cities in the USA that you might have boarded. Of them all, New York made the most sense, with the amount of superhuman activity in the city any attempt by the facility will draw too much unwanted attention, he explained as he took a sip from the orange juice he was given. How have you been faring the past two years Dr. Kinney? How is Laura? Please, call me Sarah and if you must be all formal Mrs. Kinney will do. I'm not a doctor anymore. Well not the kind of doctor I was before, now I'm just a civilian doctor. Don't people recognize you? That is why wigs have been invented D, I'm sorry, this is awkward, mumbled Sarah as she attempted to find the words she needed. No Mrs. Kinney, I still can't remember my name, said DX as if reading her very mind. So, you still want me to call you DX? That is a designation, not a name. If you would like, she let the unspoken offer hanging. No thank you Mrs. Kinney, I have been remembering things, memories that are not mine, or I think they are not mine. What kind of things D, D, questioned the blonde as he raised an eyebrow. I won't keep calling you DX, I think D is a good compromise, she gave him a wink and smiled warmly. Rolling it around a couple of seconds he smiled back and nodded lightly. So about these things, well, he trailed off. A demonstration would be better. He stood from his seat at the kitchen table and walked to the nearest wall with Sarah right behind him. Breathing softly in a rhythm for several seconds he lifted his right hand and bit his lower lip as he concentrated his energy into it. After a second the palm of his hand took on an orange-yellow glow. Nodding once he laid his palm on the wall and discharged the energy into it. Sarah could hardly believe her eyes as the solid wall suddenly turned to jelly as light ripples from DX's hand coursed through its length. She was about to voice her astonishment when the blonde turned to her and offered his hand which she took after a second of hesitation which turned into panic as DX walked forward through the still rippling wall and dragged her with him. Sarah was about to scream when she found herself on the other side and in her living room. I have several other such abilities though they all need for me to make contact by touch and concentrate so it isn't very combat effective, yet. DX explained as he waved his hand in front of the wall which immediately stopped rippling and became solid once again. Wow, I never believed in magic before, she spluttered as she stared at him with widened eyes. Magic. Not a very appropriate name for some of the things I can do but it will have to work. Now tell me Mrs. Kinney, how is Laura doing? Click. Oh, why don't you ask her yourself? Sarah smiled at him while he turned around to see who had entered the flat through the front door, only to see the form of a 15-year-old girl with features quite similar to Sarah's except the choice of clothes, leather skirt, boots and jacket. Wordlessly DX approached the younger girl and stood a couple of feet from her before he slowly lifted his right hand and laid it upon her left cheek and holding it there for several seconds before he fully embraced the girl, something which Laura returned wholeheartedly. Watched from behind them Sarah's smile broadened as she watched the two teens bond with each other. Later that night, after dinner DX, Sarah and Laura were sitting around the living room, the blonde retelling them his activities in the past two and a half years. So after I took down the fifth facility in San Francisco I found myself at a dead end. I did not find any more information on more facilities when I raided the San Francisco branch so when I found that information about you, I decided to come and find you. Where are your possessions? I'm sure you didn't come here with only the clothes you currently wear. Questioned Laura as she folded her knees to her chest on the couch she was sitting. In the van parked out in front. I have a few spare sets of clothes several sets of uniforms i use on missions and a lot of weapons and technology plundered from both facility bases aim hideouts and hydra sleeper cells that and several billion dollars i was able to steal from them all in a swiss bank account wow said sarah bluntly so what now if you've really hit a dead end what does that mean that there are no more facilities doubtful though that gives us time to relax and prepare for the future we should fi kaboom the loud explosion drew all three of them to the balcony where one could see the Avengers mansion, further insurance on Sarah's part. Using almost all the money she had she had bought a top floor flat near the one place in New York with the lowest crime rate. The problem however was that the Avengers mansion was currently in flames. 
This does not bode well, muttered Laura as she could clearly see that combat was taking place on the grounds of Avengers HQ. Two months later, it had been two months since the madness that occurred on the ground of the Avengers mansion and the subsequent death of many of the greatest superheroes of New York, heroes like Clint Burton, Hawkeye, and The Vision. All of which was caused by insanity that the Scarlet Witch had succumbed to. Realizing that the security plan that Sarah had relayed was now compromised due to the disbandment of the Avengers the three of them had begun to prepare for the worst using all the technology DX, or D as both females had now started calling him was able to bring with him when he first came to New York. Luckily for them the apartment they were now sharing was on the top of a 20-story building so one of the rooms had a direct stairway to the attic where most of the high-tech and weapons were stored. After some mishaps and failures, they had been able to rig up an AIM monitoring device that they now used to eavesdrop on the police from time to time, or shield. Though listening in on them was risky since the device was only experimental and although it worked well enough to allow them to listen in on chatter from the secret organization undeterred or tracked, they didn't want to screw up and bring shield down on their heads so they agreed to spy on them only when things were really going downhill in New York. At the moment, while Sarah was still working in the nearby hospital, DX was waiting for Laura to finish up at the local school so he could escort her home like he did every day. He had to wait for only a couple of minutes before the school bell rang and the students left for their homes. A minute later Laura came walking out though for some reason she was staring at the backs of a group of three boys. DX had seen them many times, they were three friends it would seem, though why was Laura staring at them so hard bewildered him. Is anything wrong? He asked her the moment she reached him, still staring at the backs of the three boys. There is something wrong D, she answered cryptically though he knew she would explain everything in a couple of seconds. The tall blonde boy with the earrings is Theodore Altman. The brunette is William Kaplan and the bald African American is Eli Bradley. They're good friends though Eli's scent has changed, before it was normal but two days ago when I was close I smelled MGH on him. She concluded as she began to walk after them, DX right at her side. So why are you so interested in him? He asked as he shoved his hands into his jeans pockets. The name Bradley sounded familiar so I looked it up at the public library during lunch break and I found that Eli's grandfather is Isaiah Bradley. The Black Captain America, I remember him being mentioned during our briefings of the Avengers and their past back in the, he trailed off not wanting to remember that part of his life. Precisely and it is very suspicious that the grandson of a super soldier is taking mutant growth hormone. Maybe he wants to follow in his grandfather's footsteps. Perhaps, though I have observed that his, Theodore and William's muscles are quite tense indicating they were working out hard these past few days, something that I haven't seen in them since I first saw them, also they are showing signs of exhaustion, all is quite suspicious, she explained as she looked up at him. So they either want to play hero, or villain, she concluded. Still, why are we following them? The corners of his mouth twitched upwards as Laura tried to find the right words. You have been taking down branches of anti-mutant organizations all over the city these past two months, seems to me like you want to be a hero as well. She smirked at him while he rolled his eyes. So you just want to do the right thing and make sure those three aren't up to no good, is that it? Yes. Okay. He shrugged his shoulders. You need to practice anyway, trailing properly is hard. This time they both smirked as they continued to shadow the three friends. If they only knew to what their actions would lead they may have thought of reconsidering, but that wasn't how they did things. Both teens were deeply scarred by their experience at the facility but their friendship gave them a means to escape from their demons. As Sarah had pointed once when they had an argument over some of the tech they were installing, they were both headstrong and stubborn, never backing down. Problem is, these qualities are a blessing but in most cases, they are a pain many would wish they didn't have to deal all the time. Who the are the young Avengers? shouted J.J. Jameson as he slammed the newly printed newspaper on his desk. Ms. Jones, you've read Ms. Farrell's article? he asked Brunette sitting in front of him. Yeah, but I, then you know that last night, six kids dressed up like Junior Avengers showed up out of nowhere and saved a dozen people from a fire in Midtown. Interrupted her J.J.J. as he began to flip through the newspaper showing the two women the pictures printed in it. Witnesses claim Thor Jr. had lighting powers, that Iron Kid's armor was more advanced than Iron Man's, that Teen Hulk was very polite, Lieutenant America was, according to Farrell here, 
extremely bossy and Wolverine's kids had claws to match and entered the blaze numerous times to bring out survivors out from environments that would deter firemen. And not to mention that the blonde one actually came out with half his face in flames which he put out and continued like nothing had happened. That Lieutenant America told me to move like ten times, groaned Cat Farrell. Where were you? asked the long-haired brunette, Jessica Jones. In his face, asking him questions, was the calm reply. While he was trying to put out a fire, the brunette asked in disbelief. What's your point? The point is. Interrupted them JJJ, nobody knows who they are, where they came from, or why they're here. That's where we come in. He looked at them sternly. By the time tomorrow's newspaper goes to bed, you ladies will have found exactly who these kids are and what right do they have to call themselves, Young Avengers. Um, Jonas. Farrell raised her hand to gain her boss's attention. Yes, Cat, they didn't exactly call themselves the Young Avengers, I did. You did it? Why? I used a question mark. Young Avengers? It was a question, she tried to defend herself. Actually, they're not. Piped up Ms. Jones as she looked at a picture of the Captain America Wanabi. That is not Captain America's uniform, it's been modified but it's Bucky's, she exclaimed. You're right. The military jacket, the domino mask, it is Bucky, confirmed JJJ. So these kids are the Avengers' new sidekicks? Asked Cat as she continued to look at the pictures of the young Avengers. The Avengers disbanded, there are no Avengers, these kids are probably a bunch of super-powered fans, scoffed the brunette. How do you know that? Questioned JJJ as he crossed his arms over his chest. Because I know Captain America and he would never put another kid's life in danger, never, insisted Ms. Jones more forcefully. You know Captain America? Questioned her college cat as the next several minutes for Ms. Jones turned into hellish embarrassment as she was introduced to the horrors of the internet and her own fan clubs. So what's your next move? Contact what's left of the Avengers? Asked Cat as the two women strolled out of the Daily Bugle. I'll try, but I'm not as connected as Jonah, thinks. She ended lamely as two figures she never expected to meet in this specific place or time came gliding down towards her. Jessica Jones? Asked none other than Captain America himself as he was holding tight to his friend, Iron Man, Tony Stark. Hey Jess, how are you? Uh, Jessica on the other hand was at a loss for words. Sorry to just show up like this but we need to talk, continued Captain America. Um, I guess, but where? After a little help from Iron Man the three of them flew off to one of the skyscraper's rooftops so they could talk freely. So the kids aren't yours? Questioned Jessica. No? The Maria Stark Foundation doesn't have enough money to fund an adult team of Avengers, let alone a junior one. Did you notice the Bucky thing? Continued the brunette. We did. I'm sure these kids mean well but, Wolverine's blonde mini-me and the girl. Those two are bad news. Explained Cap as Jessica rose an eyebrow at him indicating for him to continue his explanation. I hope I'm wrong but with those claws and healing powers I'm sure those two were the ones responsible for the assassination of presidential candidate Greg Johnson and a good friend of mine, Congressman Samuel Hudson. What? exclaimed Jessica wide-eyed. That is why it's imperative to find them and shut them down, I hope with all my heart that those two are no longer the same kids that committed those and God knows how many more murders but one humanitarian act won't clean their slate, they must be brought to answer for their crimes. Concluded Captain America as he stared at Jessica with hard eyes. Okay but how exactly are you planning to do that? We'll find them first and then talk to them, hopefully we will be able to avoid violence. If they are mutants we'll contact the Xavier Institute. Well you can certainly try, but do you think they will listen? Are the two, assassins, related to Wolverine in some way? As far as we know, no, don't worry, they'll listen, all we need to do is find them. Good luck with that, the two males could easily detect the sarcasm in her voice. It was good to see you Jess, said Captain America as he took a firm grip of Iron Mon's suit and waited for him to take off. Let us know if you find out anything, called Tony Stark as he took off. Yeah, sure muttered Jessica as she watched the two heroes fly away. Later that night the city that never sleeps actually had a reason not to sleep as five gunmen had crashed a wedding in St. Patrick's Cathedral and were holding over 200 people as hostages. As the lead gunman was gloating about the police's cooperation, 
one of the bridesmaids was not enjoying the entire situation for different reasons than the rest. She had black hair and blue eyes. She was dressed in a strapless purple dress and was currently acting as a live shield for the bride. The cops are letting them get away? She asked in a hushed tone in obvious anger. Yes, Kate. That way we get to walk away, whispered the bride in her ear. That's ridicules, there are only five of them and two hundred of us, we can take them, she exclaimed louder than before. Yes, but we have guns, said the head gunman as he pointed the gun at Kate who turned her head away, unknown to them however. We should just bust through the window, muttered a teen dressed in something resembling a military uniform, black jacket and white pants with red striped on their sides with a sock mask on his head. Yeah patriot, you're buying it though and let's not forget how expensive one of these things are. Retorted a brunette teen with a winged circlet, red scarf around his neck and a large wooden staff. This is no time to argue guys, we need to take them down, now, exclaimed a green-skinned man, teen as his voice would indicate with lots of earrings. DX, do you have a spell that could help us? Questioned a teen wearing an armor similar yet seemingly more advanced than Iron Mons the color was different as well. Whereas Iron Man's was red and yellow, this armor was red and silver. Actually, I have just what we need, replied a young blonde man wearing a tight, sleeveless, spandex bodysuit that only went to his biceps, bulky black boots that reached his knees, and a pair of high tech goggles. I know what you mean, voiced the only girl of the group who was wearing a black and gray, sleeveless bodysuit, knee high boots, and mask that covered only her eyes as she unstrapped her backpack and took out several ropes and secured them to the roof while her teammate gathered energy into his hand, which he discharged on contact with the rosette window, which began to ripple like liquid. It's showtime, said the blonde while smiling. The atmosphere inside the cathedral had gotten tenser by the second as the lead gunman was still holding his firearm at Kate's head until four ropes suddenly dropped from the roof, and as everyone looked up, Six figures literally burst through the rosette window as if it was liquid. Now that's entering in style, shouted a green skinned teen as he jumped off the rope and body slammed one of the hostage takers. We need to disarm them, shouted the only girl of the six pack as she did a cartwheel away from the bystanders as to avoid the incoming gunfire and ensure that no one would get accidentally shot. Then we'll just have to take away their guns, with a little magnetism exclaimed the armored teenager as he extended both his hands and in a flash of purple all the guns were stuck to his armor which allowed patriot to disable another gunman with a well-aimed throwing star to the shoulder several bolts of lightning suddenly struck one of the felons as he rattled due to the electric attack that was sent at him by the teen with the winged circlet and staff drop it shouted the green-skinned teen at another of the gunmen who nearly pissed himself and quickly obliged with the demand huh that wasn't so bad Trust me, it gets worse, shouted the same man as he pulled a knife and went for a stab but he didn't get to that point as his knife was cut in three pieces by a pair of very wicked looking serrated claws. For you, said DX as he jumped in the air and nailed the thug in the chin with a rising kick. Nice, exclaimed the brunette boy as he distracted himself for a second which cost him greatly as one of the gunmen slugged him in the jaw, sending him crashing into his green skinned teammate, sending both of them spawning to the ground. At the same time the armored teenager was attempting to put out a fire that was started accidentally by a lightning bolt. Patriot wasn't having a better time either as one of the thugs had blindsided him while he was fighting another, but things quickly turned back around as DX and the only female on the team delivered a dropkick each, saving Patriot a lot of trouble. What are those super idiots trying to do? exclaimed the bride as she watched the fight continue. I think they're the, young avengers said kate as she turned around to look at her friend with the corner of her right eye well they're gonna get us all killed not if i can help it muttered kate as she took a few steps and knelt to take one of the guns i'll take that thanks but she didn't get to it as the lead gunman was able to sneak away as his associates got pummeled and sneaked up on her suddenly the entire fight stopped as a loud bang echoed thought the cathedral ladies and gentlemen we didn't come here to hurt anyone but if we have to we will now then let the girl go exclaimed patriot as the six young avengers surrounded the hostage taker in a sort of crescent while the others were attempting some rather harsh negotiations dx's goggles caught a slight glimmer in kate's hand making him smile moving closer to laura he pinched her lightly on the back of her arm which she seemed to not acknowledge but he knew full well that he got her attention 
Using the index finger of his left hand he touched her right shoulder blade and made a curved line leading upwards then tapped once, returning his finger to its original spot he traced a straight line and tapped twice. Making an almost unseen nod, Laura jumped to the side and attempted to circle the thug from his right. As predicted by DX, the gunman immediately turned his gun towards the girl and was about to shoot when Kate slammed one of Patriot's discarded throwing stars into his leg, just like he planned it. The last thing was up to him as he charged up and made a super speed shoulder tackle knocking the thug a good dozen feet and into a column, knocked out cold too. Nice work. He said as he offered Kate a hand, who had fallen to the ground in an attempt to get as far away from the thug as possible. Thanks. She stood up. No need to thank me or anything, she replied sarcastically. For what? We didn't need your help. Snapped Patriot as he crossed his arms over his chest but was cut off. You will if you finish that sentence, Kate was clearly not amused at the moment. Channel 2 News reporting live from St. Patrick's Cathedral where the so-called, Young Avengers botched an attempt at rescue tonight, setting fire to the cathedral and endangering countless lives. Police currently has them in custody, truly the 16s would curse their luck in the media in the morning once the news of their screw-up was out in the open. But now they had bigger problems, as in the police and the press. Young Avengers, Cat Farrell, Daily Bugle, Young Avengers, Deadpan the Green-Skinned Teen. What? You don't like the name, it's a little on the nose, don't you think? Said the brunette male as he was confronted by a different reporter. So, what do you call yourselves? This time it was Jessica Jones who asked the question. Asgardian, Hulkling, let's go, Iron Lad, wait, put me down demanded Patriot as he tried to vainly struggle against his teammate's grip while DX simply took Iron Lad's offered hand and allowed himself to be flown off. And you guys think, Young Avengers, is on the nose, muttered Cat as she jotted down the teens' names on a notepad. What are Lieutenant America's and Wolverine's kids' names? Patriot and X-23, DX is the blonde, what's yours? asked Hulkling as Asgardian lifted him and X-23 into the air. I'm Jessica Jones. Jessica shouted back due to the cacophony around her. Jessica Jones? As in Jewel? Oi, here's my card? She was able to hand Hulkling her calling card before Asgardian rose higher into the air above the thong of people around them. Guys, we're leaving now. Jessica Jones wants us to call her, exclaimed the green skinned teen. Jessica Jones, as in Jewel? asked Asgardian just loud enough for Jess and Kat to hear them. Asgardian. Concentrate on flying, shouted X-23 as she glared at the brunette who muttered a sorry. You were right, exclaimed Cat with a broad smile. They're fanboys, who are you calling? She asked as Jessica pulled out her cell phone. My boyfriend, minutes later, Avengers Mansion front yard. Iron Lad, come on man, let me go, exclaimed Patriot as he continued to struggle, obviously not comfortable with being carried around like a sack. You're gonna break both your legs, I'm gonna break both your legs if you don't let me go. Very much obvious that he didn't enjoy the feeling of being carried around, maybe it was his pride? Guys, shut up, we're trying to run away from the cops, not attract them here. Chances are that someone other than the police will be showing up, spoke X-23 calmly as Asgardian let her down to the ground. Why's that X? asked Hulkling as he looked at her with a raised eyebrow. That woman that gave you the card, Jessica Jones, Jewel, she was a former Avenger. She paused again so the information could sink in. Oh man, muttered Asgardian as he finally caught on. Ah oh, this is just swell, the senior Avengers are probably on our tracks as we speak, cursed Patriot. And whose fault is that? Great, here we go, muttered the brunette teen as he was walked a little back so as to not get caught in the fireworks. No one's spoke DX calmly as he stretched his arms. Except for the curtain catching fire, we did very well even when the situation shifted and the target used a live shield. It's no one's fault that one of the former Avengers was on the scene of the crime. The operation could have gone even faster and more efficient if we had disabled them with force, muttered X 23 as she crossed her arms under her S and frowned at the other five. You know it would have only gotten worse if you two used your claws or I started shooting ion blasts at them, explained Iron Lad as he shrugged his shoulders. How so? A quick slice on their tendons would have disabled them from the begging, 
minimizing the treat to both the hostages and the hostage takers who could have been accidentally killed if Asgardian messed one of his lightning attacks and Hulkling didn't pull his punches. X-23 placed her hands on her hips, leaned forward and continued to frown in the direction of the five males as they all stared at her, four with widened eyes. Yes, but that is not what heroes do, is it? Spoke DX as he waved his right hand. The public would never accept us as heroes if we used brutal tactics against our adversaries unless it is absolutely necessary. If we did do that X, we should probably name ourselves the, young punishers. We do need a name don't we? The right side of DX's mouth twitched upwards making the others chuckle at his joke. Bottom line, we did good, but not that good so we should meet again and train tomorrow night. I mean, if we can't take down five thugs easily, how can we face the real enemy? If he shows up, muttered Patriot, clearly still angry at Iron Lad. He will. And when he does, he will stop at nothing to get what he wants. Then how do we even stop him? He is Kong the Conqueror, exclaimed Patriot as he got into Iron Lad's face. Snicked. With lethal force of course, and no pulling back punches. Said DX as he pointed the claws of his left hand at the two bickering teens making them both flinch. Yeah but for now we rest, school's tomorrow said Asgardian as he and Hulking walked away after giving Iron Lad, Jessica Jones calling card. Good luck, you guys, said Patriot over his shoulder as he walked away. Will you be okay Iron Lad? asked X-23 as she watched at the red and silver clad team. Yeah, I'm fine, I hope he can cool off before Kong arrives because when he does, we'll need all the help we can get. Don't worry, we'll find a way to beat him, the Avengers always did and after all, we're the, young Avengers. Smiling DX offered his hand which Iron Lad shook, then X-23's before walking to the front door of the mansion. Come on D, my mom is probably unpleased with tonight's events, said Laura as she tugged on his right arm. Yeah, sure thing Laura lets go. Walking through the Avengers mansion gave Iron Lad some very conflicting emotions for several different reasons and he couldn't help himself. Look at this place, Avengers assemble, he muttered with a lot of sarcasm. Funny you should say that. Said a mechanical voice behind him but being a teen meant being impulsive which meant that you would pull the trigger before allowing people to explain themselves, or in this case ion blast them. Who's there? We were just about to ask you the same question. Said none other the Captain America himself as he lowered his shield which he used to deflect the ion blast from Iron Man and Jessica Jones who were both standing behind him and in the same second, Iron Lad knew he was just screwed. What's your name, son? How did you disable the alarm system? What are you doing here? Where did you get that armor? Iron Lad was not comfortable at the moment, not at all as two of the USA's, heck the world's greatest heroes showered him with numerous questions without bothering to wait for him to answer. Luckily for him salvation came in the form of Jessica Jones. Guys, ease up, okay? So Iron, kid? Iron, boy? Iron lad? Lad? Really, I'm, but the armored teen cut her off. Jessica Jones formerly Jewel. Also Nitrous. Okay, never mind the fact that you know all that, I'm just gonna introduce you to Captain America here. Said Jessica while making a strange face. It's an honor sir, sorry about the ion blast. Iron lad replied with a shy smile on his face, honestly, what could he say when speaking with someone like Captain America? And this is obviously Iron Man, said Jessica as she stood behind the aforementioned superhero. Where did you get the armor? Though said superhero was very blunt at the moment. It's a long story, you probably wouldn't believe it, Iron Lad tried to avoid that subject for as long as possible. Try me, but knew he couldn't hide it forever, it's neurokinetic. The technology is a little advanced. By at least 10 years exclaimed Iron Man as he used all his bodysuit's available sensors to analyze the strange set of armor. Actually, it's more like a thousand C, Iron Lad took off his helmet to reveal a handsome face of a brunette boy with blue eyes. I'm from the 30th century, they call me Kong. At a nearby hospital, while Patriot, Asgardian and Hulkling were dealing with some drug dealers, Iron Lad was explaining his actions and history to Captain America. Iron Man and Jessica Jones aka Jewel and the two former living weapons were receiving a pep talk from a very irritated mother, Kate Bishop was not enjoying her night. Not that was much more enjoyable to begin with as certain events had taken place, 
but now she was forced to sit on the sidewalk while her father was arguing with doctors about how important it was for someone to take a look at her, not that she was hurt or anything. That's the bishop girl. The one who saved them all, said a nurse as she walked past her. With what? Her daddy's credit cards. Her friend, however, didn't have much fate in her. Apparently a throwing star. I guess if your dad's Derek Bishop you have to be prepared for everything. Kate examined the throwing star that had saved her as she scoffed at the bigot's remarks. Her father was still raising hell inside the hospital's reception room. Hey, you're the girl from the cathedral, right? Mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Kate turned around to see a girl younger than her with blonde hair tied in a ponytail, blue eyes and dressed in jeans, a Hulk t-shirt and a white jacket. Who are you? She asked. I'm Cassie Lang said the girl and it took Kate only a second to make the connection. Oh my god, you're Ant-Man's daughter, she exclaimed as she pointed at the girl. Yes I am, was, I'm actually looking for the young Avengers. They're not here, they flew off, do you know in which direction? Um, towards the park I think, so they might be heading for the mansion, thanks, said Cassie as she turned and walked away. Wait, are you a, part of them? No, but I'm gonna be replied Cassie with a smirk and determined face. Thinking it over for only a couple of seconds Kate took one last look at her father who was still arguing with one of the doctors and turned around to see Cassie's retreating back. Hey, Cassie, wait up. Getting to the Avengers mansion and sneaking in wasn't hard for the two girls but as soon as they came to a very large hole in the ground, Cassie couldn't hold it in and started crying. Oh my god, this is it. She all but whispered. What, what is it? asked Kate as she laid a hand on her shoulder. This is where my dad died, Sniff they told me and my mom that Jack of Hearth had come back, everyone thought he was dead, so my dad ran out to see if he was okay and Jack of Hearts, he, exploded. They said dad died instantly, that he didn't feel any pain but I. Want to get out of here? asked Kate as she looked at the younger girl with concern. No, no, I want to at least go in and get my dad's spare costume. Come on I'll give you the tour but she was cut off mid-speech as a lightning bolt hit the ground several meters in front of them. I don't know how you kids got in here, but you're gonna have to leave, said Patriot boldly as he put his hands on his hips, Hulkling and Asgardian behind him. This is private property, he continued. And this is Cassie Lang. Ant-Man's daughter, now who's trespassing? stated Kate as the three teens quickly turned their heads to look at Cassie. And I'm the one who saved you at the cathedral, remember? You did not. You created a diversion, insisted Patriot. I had to do something. Thanks to you, I almost died. We were trying to help, said Patriot quietly as he turned his head away. The three other teens were looking at the bickering pair with blank faces. You guys are the ones who need saving. You nearly got us all killed if it wasn't for the blonde and the other girl. Which is why me and Ant Girl want to join the Young Avengers. Finished Kate boldly as she laid her hands on Cassie's shoulders. Problem was, she wasn't all that convincing. Ant Girl. Deadpanned Patriot. The Young Avengers is not our official name, by the way, said Hulkling. So, do you guys have powers? Asgardian had the most intelligent question, one which the girls weren't exactly keen on answering. No, muttered Cassie. Not powers per se, but. Look, if I can just get my dad's gear, how old are you? asked Patriot a bit sternly. Fifteen said cassie no seriously how old are you he was obviously not so easily tricked seriously i'm 15 in june look i'm just gonna get my dad's gear and she tried to walk past him but he was having none of that and grabbed her arm no you're not okay you're gonna want to take your hand off me if you want to keep it threatened cassie as she turned to face the stubborn teen i thought you said you didn't have powers i don't she grabbed Patriot's arm and flung him into the nearby bushes. But I've been kidnapped enough times for my mother to decide to sign me up on self defense classes. That was awesome. Sorry, Patriot, chuckled Hulkling as he helped his friend up to his feet. I'm not going anywhere. My father was an Avenger and this was his home, and one weekend every month, it was mine too. Now he's dead and all I have left of him is in that mansion. So I don't care who you are, or what powers you do have. I'm not leaving without it. Cassie ranted in Patriot's face as something very, very unexpected happened. Cassie, I thought you said you didn't have any powers, said Kate a little shakily. I don't, 
that's not how it looks from down here. The brunette finished lamely as Cassie finally looked down and realized that she had considerably grown in size, by just, oh about 50 feet. Inside Avengers Mansion. The vision? exclaimed Iron Man, Tony Stark as he gazed at the holographic image of their old and now dead friend, that was produced by Iron Lads, Kang's armor. But the vision was destroyed. How did you, Steve Rogers aka Captain America couldn't believe his eyes as well. I downloaded the Vision's operating system and data files into my armor, explained Kong. So, he's, alive? asked Jessica Jones aka Jewel. Lump. But before Kong could answer the earth shook under their feet, the sound coming from the front of the mansion. What was that? asked Jessica, an earthquake. On the upper east side. It's him. It's Kong. exclaimed Iron Lad as he and the three Avengers. Well two Avengers and one former Avenger ran outside to see what was happening only two stare wide-eyed at the scene in front of them. Cassie Lang who was not 50 foot tall was lying unconscious on the ground, her clothes barely holding and giving her some modesty as the three young Avengers and one would-be heroine were fussing over her. Oh, my god, is that? Cassie, Cap shouted as he rushed into the front yard. Well, fine, get going, muttered Sarah Kinney as she laid her right palm over her face her left hand resting on her hip as she watched the commotion unfold from her apartment's balcony as the two teens under her care left in a sprint. She had spent the last 15 minutes lecturing them on responsibility and subtlety and now it was all for naught. She knew the success of their plan was a long shot at best but if they said the right words and played their cards right, they may just be able to swing Captain America's mind and make him forgive them. All three of them knew that S.H.I.E.L.D. relied on metahumans to take care of other metahumans so if one of the Avengers took the kid's side it was more or less a guarantee that all would lay off their case, sure there would be 24-7 surveillance for the next couple of months but if they didn't screw up all would end well. Now she only hoped that after tonight's fiasco at St. Patrick that both her children had made the right decision by perusing the superhero career. Wait a second. Since when did she consider D her own? She smiled broadly and shook her head as she saw the two teens sprint down the street towards the Avengers mansion. Cassie! shouted Steve Rogers aka Captain America as he and Iron Man, Tony Stark, Jessica Jones, Jewel and Iron Lad, Kong the Conqueror before he became a conqueror sprinted to the unconscious girl. Is she okay? asked Patriot. Does she look okay to you? snapped Kate. Cassie! honey? can you hear me? She continued softly trying to wake the younger, yet bigger girl. What happened? What happened to Cassie? asked Cap as he knelt down next to the blonde. She got upset. She started growing and she kind of, fainted. Muttered Kate as she stared in awe at the living legend before her. What upset her? inquired Iron Lad. Um, we did. She wanted to go in the mansion and get her dad's stuff but, Hulkling was cut off as Cassie began to stir. Cassie? It's Cap, can you hear me, Cap? Why are you, so small, muttered Cassie groggily as she tried to stay awake. I'm not small, you grew, I did, how, I don't know, think you can shrink down for me? God, I hope so. Sure you can, Cass. Just think small, exclaimed Kate beside her as she encouraged her. Shutting her eyes, Cassie breathed in and out several times before she felt herself shrink before she returned to her normal size. Her clothes on the other hand were completely useless. Adagirl, come on let get you inside. Cap laid his hands on her shoulder and led her inside followed by Kate. Okay. I'm gonna take off. Said Patriot quietly but he didn't make it one step before something big, red and yellow stood in his path. You're not going anywhere. I knew I should have headed home earlier, thought Patriot as he, Asgardian and Hulkling were herded into the mansion by Iron Man. Once inside Iron Man took Cassie to her father's room while Jessica and Cap stayed in the meeting room to keep the kids company and get the information they needed from them. So, where are the other two that are a part of your team? The girl and the blonde? asked Cap with a frown on his face as he crossed his arms over his chest. Right behind you, a voice came from the shadows and everyone except Iron Lad, since he had night vision and saw the new arrivals, jumped out of their skin as Dee and Laura came from entryway. Cap had his shield on and pointed at the direction of the two former weapons the moment he heard them and the fact that he didn't lower it even as they approached made the other four young Avengers a little nervous. So I was right, snarled Captain America between gritted teeth. You two better give me one good reason why I shouldn't call shield right now, 
he shouted as he took a step towards them, shocking the rest of the occupants of the room. We haven't come here to fight Captain America. We're here because our friends are here, said Laura with a neutral voice. Then you are either stupid or have a lot of guts, clearly Cap wasn't going to trust them soon. Maybe both. Smiled DX as he lifted his hands in the air to indicate that he wasn't armed, or as unarmed as he could be. This is no laughing matter boy. You too are responsible for the death of many people, some of them my friends. The only reason why S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't have this place and you in lockdown is because you M.A.Y. have turned a new leaf. Now get over here, sit down and we will wait for a friend of mine to show up. Commanded Captain America as he pointed his shield at them. There was heavy silence for several minutes as Cap glared at the two former assassins while the others looked at them in wonder. Knock, 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 until someone announced his presence at the front door. It's open, shouted Cap, never taking his eyes off the two kids. You told me it was an emergency, how can I help? Said none other the daredevil as he walked inside the room attracting the attention of all the people in it. I need your help with a small interrogation, daredevil. You can detect when someone is lying so I need your expertise. Cap spoke sharply, still not taking his eyes of the two. Turning his head at the ones that Captain America was glaring at, Daredevil raised an eyebrow under his mask and turned back around to the super soldier indicating for him to elaborate. Those two are responsible for the murders of presidential candidate Greg Johnson and 27 people including two children and Congressman Samuel Hudson along with over 200 people including 14 children. And now they are trying to be heroes, seeing as they came voluntarily I am giving them this one chance to explain themselves and I need for you to tell me if they are lying. Concluded the hero as Daredevil simply nodded. Well, which one of you will go first? Raising his hand, DX took a deep breath and began. There is no easy way to explain ourselves, frankly there is no way to explain what me and X-23 were forced to do. Your real names? Demand Ed Cap as he leaned on his fists across the table. My name is Laura Kinney and we just call him D since he doesn't remember his name, said Laura as she then pointed at DX. You don't remember it? questioned Daredevil as he crossed his arms over his chest, his billy stick in hand. No, when I was probably 12 I suffered a heavy case of amnesia and the first memory I have, ever, is of me waking in the facility where Laura was created. All eyes turned on Laura as she looked from left to right before looking in Cap's eyes. I am a 98% genetic replica of Weapon X. Your Wolverine's clone, spluttered Daredevil in disbelief as he uncrossed his arms and stared at her along with everyone else. Yes, snicked. Instantly Cap and Daredevil were put on guard but Larua didn't even look at them as she continued. When I was seven my claws, a genetic inheritance from the original Weapon X were coated with adamantium. Snicked. She looked up at D indicating for him to continue. Mine were originally made from steel and surgically inserted via lasers due to my high healing factor not allowing the surgeons to apply them. Snicked. He showed them his own pair of wrist blades. Snicked along with a unique pair of claws. He showed them the claws that extended under a 90 degree angle from his wrists. To answer your question Captain America, the reason why we committed all those murders and assassinations was because, we didn't know any better. Cap by now was furious and was about to bang the table with his fists but Daredevil laid a hand on his shoulder and when the super soldier looked at him, the man with no fear simply shook his head. We did not know better, continued Laura with a monotone voice. Because that was how we were taught to think, when we were briefed about the Avengers, we were instructed to not engage in abort mission, capture was not an option. We didn't know anything about the world, how it worked, about laws and morals. We were, literally bred to kill, to us you were metahumans, not superheroes like everyone think of you. You were simply our enemy, our target, our mark, nothing more, nothing less. She finished, by now everyone's eyes were widened, including Cap's. To us captain. DX began to speak again. Those who made us what we are, made sure that we will do what they wanted, living weapons and not assassins, not soldiers. When we killed all those people we simply knew that that was our mission and nothing else. Looking him in the eye for several seconds, Cap turned to look at Daredevil who simply nodded his head indicating that every word the two former living weapons had said was the truth. How did you escape? Questioned the American legend as he turned back around. My mother freed us from our cells and made up a plan, we followed it and we killed everyone in the facility, began Laura. After that, 
I stayed behind so Laura and her mother could escape and began hunting down other facilities and their clients, Hydra, AIM, Kingpin's henchmen. Everyone who hired us to kill for them I hunted while Laura and her mother were in hiding, waiting for everything to cool down. Finished DX. Looking up, Cap surveyed the four other males in the room who had hung their heads down. Did you know? He asked them, they all nodded. Not every detail, just a little for us to know that they had done some really bad things in the past and that they wanted to help us, explained Hulkling. Turning around, Captain America strapped his shield to his back and slowly walked out of the room. I'll need a minute to think this over. He muttered just loud enough for them to hear as Jessica walked out behind him, wanting to talk to him as well. Frowning, Daredevil put his hands on his hips and looked at the seven teenagers in the other end of the room. Shaking his head he sighed as he walked to the nearest chair that was on the other side of the table from them, he sat down and lifted his feet on the table before crossing his hands behind his head. So, heard there was some ruckus earlier this night. You guys know anything about it? He may be the man with no fear when he donned the mask, but he was still Matt Murdock and as a lawyer, he had a way with words as the faces of the seventeens light up in an instant. Yep, he was just good. What are you gonna do Steve? asked Jessica as she stood behind Captain America who was simply standing at the middle of the room, head hung low. Honestly? asked Cap as he turned to look at her. I have, no idea, they still need to answer for their crimes? But if you hand them over to S.H.I.E.L.D., is it a guarantee that they won't use the kids the same way? They have had enough experience with Hydra to know how to brainwash someone and you know it. You give those two to them and their lives are over. Period. But, how can I simply forgive them for all the murders they have committed in cold blood? He asked her slowly as he looked at his hands. Look Steve, they've escaped their captors, when? Three years ago? They haven't done anything bad in that time, well yeah, DX did say that he took down some of this, facility's, former clients but considering who those guys were? Is it a bad thing? All I'm saying is that they deserve a chance to prove themselves. Cap stayed silent for several minutes as he thought over Jessica's words. On one side she was right, the two teens obviously didn't want to continue their former occupation and were determined to prove that they deserved a chance, and on the other hand, there was still the fact that they had murdered hundreds if not thousands of people, though considering who their clients were it was highly likely that their targets were no saints either, far from it. Sigh, I'll have to hear the rest of the kids out until I can reach a decision, Cap said casually as he walked out of the room. Jessica looked at him and smiled. He could have called shield with a flick of a button but he would give the teens a chance all right bellowed cap as he re-entered the dining room cutting the story telling just as it was getting to the good part according to asgardian i want to hear about the rest of you so for now you too he pointed at laura and d making all six would be avengers smile are off the hook we will talk later but for now besides the six of you are there any more young avengers running around that we don't know of no sir that's all of us their patriot, please, muttered the junior super soldier. Asgaridan, it's an honor, sir, and Hulkling. The green skinned teen simply gave a wave of his hand. Ahem. Kate coughed in her hand to gain their attention. And this is the young lady who helped us at the cathedral. But you're not a young Avenger? asked Cap as he walked forward along with Jessica. No, sir, not at the moment at least. Though it would seem that all the team slots are full, she frowned. Who told you that? Then why is Cassie not part of the Young Avengers? Because she wasn't a part of the Avengers fail safe program. Well, neither were Dee and Laura, but they proved that they should be on the team. Kong muttered the last part as a phantom pain found itself into his ribs as he remembered how the four boys had met the two former living weapons. Our first meeting was eventful. Flashback Avengers Mansion, Dining Room. Hey guys piped up Asgardian as he donned his winged circlet and swung his satchel over his shoulder. Did you get the feeling we were being watched while we were walking to the mansion? The other three males looked at him with a raised eyebrow for several seconds. You're just imagining things Billy, chuckled Hulkling as he fixed the zipper on his shirt. Or someone needs to be more alert. A slightly humorous male voice echoed through the room setting all four teens on edge, then, as if from nowhere. Two figures stepped from the shadowed entryway and into the room. After several seconds of staring each other, the silence was broken. Laura, what are you doing here? And who's that? said Patriot as he pointed a finger at the raven haired girl. We were following you. She stayed as she walked to the dining table and plopped down on it, 
her feet dangling from the side as the blonde stranger took one of the chairs and sat in it. And this is my friend D. We were wondering why you sneaked into the Avengers mansion so we followed you in to make sure you stay out of trouble, she tilted her head to the side as the edges of her mouth twitched upwards. But it seems that trouble is what you are looking for, and judging by the costumes, you're either stupid or just plain suicidal, stated D with more humor in his voice. Hey! exclaimed Patriot as he pointed a finger at the two. What give you the right to decide whether we're able to go out there and help people or not? Snicked. You could hear a pin drop as four pairs of claws were ejected from their hiding places and brought to the outside, gleaming with the little light that shone in the room. By now all four teens were sweating bullets, even though you couldn't see that on Patriot and Iron Lad due to the full body costumes. Do you even know how to fight? Asked D as he stood up, followed by Laura. Do you know the risks, the potential dangers? Continued Laura where he left off. Why don't we see what you've got, though guy? Then we'll decide if you're ready or not. Shouted the last part D as he and Laura lunged at the terrified would-be superheroes. End flashback. Cap, Jessica, Kate and Daredevil were staring at Iron Lad as if he had grown a second head when he finished his story. You're saying that, started Daredevil as he turned to look at the two formed assassins. They beat the stuffing out of you so you let them in your team? Um, yes, that is more or less how it happened, muttered Iron Lad as he lowered his head in shame. So this Avengers fail-safe program, where did it come from? Kong, asked Jessica as she and Cap frowned when they remembered the real point of the conversation. No ma'am. The Vision. Once I downloaded the data from the Vision's CPU, I went looking for a way to contact, and hopefully reassemble the Avengers. But instead I found a program designed to locate and identify the next wave of Avengers, should the current team be disbanded, or worse, wiped out. Explained Iron Lad as he used his suit to make a holographic projection of the USA with several dots indicating suitable candidates to fill the ranks of the Avengers. How could we not know about this? Muttered Cap as he leaned in to get a better look. And what constitutes the next wave? Asked Jessica. We're not sure, as far as I know, it seems that each of us, besides Laura and Dee have some connection with the Avengers or the Avengers history. What kind of connection? Cap's eyebrows furrowed under his mask as he observed the four teens. We were hoping you could tell us, said Hulkling. Maybe if we told you our real names, suggested Asgardian before Patriot cut him off. No, they're called secret identities for a reason, he argued. Patriot, that's Captain America, argued the brunette as he took of his circlet. Yeah, and she's a civilian. The super soldier in training pointed at Kate who immediately got angry. A civilian who saved your life, she snapped at him. When are you gonna let it go? When you finally admit it, she got into his face as she yelled at him. If I do, will you leave? He asked with a lot of sarcasm. No, probably not. The argument continued for a minute before Cap frowned and interfered, saving everyone a lot of headaches. Finally conceding, Kate left the young and old Avengers alone and walked out the front to wait for them to finish. I'm Billy Kaplan. My parents are Jeff and Rebecca. He's a cardiologist, she's a psychologist. Two little brothers, both obnoxious. Does this mean anything to you guys? Asked Asgardian aka Billy Kaplan as he and the rest of the occupants of the room were seated around the large table. No, I'm sorry. Said Cap. What about your powers Billy? You generate electricity, lighting? Asked Jessica. Um, yeah, kinda. Demonstrating, Billy lifted his right hand and generated a ball of electricity to envelop it. What about you, Hulkling? Continued Steve as he turned to look at the green-skinned, green-haired teen. My name is Teddy Altman. I've got super strength. Any, anger issues? I don't, Hulk out. If that's what you mean, at least not any more than most 16-year-olds. How do you get your powers? Radiation or, I don't know, none of us knows, except Larua and Patriot. Patriot, why don't you sit down and talk about yourself, son? Cap tried to be as open as possible. All knew he had a soft spot for children, though it didn't help him this time as Patriot quickly snapped back at him. First of all, I ain't your son, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. And second of all, why should we tell you our secrets when the only reason you came here was to shut us down? He all but shouted making both Cap and Jessica look down. That was what you were planning to do, isn't it? that and probably sending Dee and Laura off to jail, 
the last part he did shout, making both the current and retired hero flinch lightly, though for Cap it was internally, on the outside, his face was set in stone. Patriot, if I'm in any way responsible for you, Steve tried to explain but he was cut off with a snort from the masked teen. Don't worry, you're not, then why are you wearing Bucky's, why are you wearing that uniform? Out of respect for the first Captain America, the real Captain America, shouted Patriot as he pointed a finger at the senior super soldier who simply muttered a name, Isaiah Bradley. My grandfather, continued Patriot, the black Captain America, he finished as he took of his mask to show his brown skin and clean-shaved head. Is everything all right Cap? We heard shouting. Asked Iron Man the moment he stepped into the room as he lead a puffy-eyed Cassie, indicating that she was crying, who was wearing a red and black costume that once belonged to her father, Ant-Man. No, everything, all right. But tell me, how is it possible that you have inherited your grandfather's powers? The question made Patriot even angrier but he comprised himself enough to be able to explain without shouting. Because before the American army decided to cook up their white Captain America, they tested the super soldier serum on a platoon of black soldiers, all of whom died. Except your grandfather, I know the story. He had a daughter, Sarah Gale, your mother, continued Cap for him as he closed his eyes, not wanting to meet the glaring ones of his younger super soldier counterpart, who was born before he was given the serum. So how, he left the question unasked. I got into a fight a while back, muttered Patriot slowly, lost a lot of blood. And Isaiah's blood matched yours, finished for him Captain America remorsefully. Look I appreciate what you kids are trying to do, but, he laid a hand on the teen's shoulder. You want to shut us down? Tell me Captain, how do you intend to do that? Furrowing his eyebrows. Patriot stepped back just as Asgardian put his circlet back on and took his staff and D and Laura stood from their seats and moved next to their teammates, all of whom were frowning at the direction of the older Avengers. Nice going Cap, muttered Daredevil as he walked behind his friend. Wump, but before anyone could either speak or act, the earth shook once again. You kids stay here, Iron Man, Daredevil, with me? Cap barked out orders like the soldier that he was as everyone prepared for what could come next. K R A S H. Where is he? Where is the master? bellowed the armored giant that crashed through the wall and plunged the room into chaos. Who is this guy? shouted Patriot amidst the chaos as he jumped back to avoid one of the behemoth's tree trunk sized arms. The growing man, he fought Thor, the Avengers, the Thunderbolts, lectured Asgardian as he levitated into the air and charged up with lighting. God, you really are fanboys, aren't you? shouted Jessica as Cap led her away from harm. Whatever you do, don't, thought, but he didn't get to finish his sentence as Hulkling smashed his fist into the growing man's nose, hit him, he finished lamely as the giant began to fall backwards. The more you hit him, the more he, grows, something odd happened though as the growing man simply, didn't grow. I don't know, sir, his growth seems to be, stunted, deadpanned Hulkling as he stood up after landing in a crouch. Probably because he isn't growing, muttered DX as he dusted himself off. Well, that's never happened before, said Captain America as he watched the downed giant with a raised eyebrow. I guess they don't make him like, but before he could continue, the growing man evaporated in a cloud of smoke and from it came out about a dozen, midget sized versions of him, all chanting, Where is the master? Okay, this completely violates growing man's continuity, said Asgardian with sarcasm as the tiny men surrounded the six young Avengers. Asgardian, this is not the time, now focus, snapped Laura as her eyes darted to and fro. Man does she have him whipped, mumbled Daredevil making Jessica snicker despite their current predicament. What do we do? exclaimed Iron Lad as he looked from left to right. Subdue them. They all turned to look at Captain America who had just yelled. Don't fight them, subdue them. After sharing a look, all six teens launched and each grabbed one or two of the tiny versions of Kang's servant, but it proved an ineffective strategy as the little guys grappled with all they had. Oh my god, they're stimuloids. I invented them, Asgardian, can you hold them back? He flew a little over the ground along with the brunette team. Lighting doesn't work on them, then use your other powers, he exclaimed. Are you Sue? Just do it, you don't have to yell muttered Asgardian as he swung his staff in a circle and a ring of blue energy shot out around them, 
stunning the stimuloids and allowing Iron Lad to take of his helmet and bellow out with all his lungs. I am Kong. I am your master. The moment he did that, all of the stimuloids looked at him and after a second disappeared in a flash of green light. What are they doing? Sending a signal, letting Kong know they found me, said the young Kong as he dropped to the ground. How long do we have? asked Larua as she brushed herself off. Not long, we have to prepare, muttered the time traveler. Then I guess we better train you, piped an Iron Man making the six young Avengers and one blonde wannabe Avenger looked at him oddly. Look at this place, muttered Iron Man as he stepped through the hole in the dining room wall. Do you think it was fair of us to lock them inside the training room? asked Daredevil as he dialed the number of Hulkling's parents. It's for their own good. If Kong really does show up, they could get themselves killed, said Cap as he leaned in his chair. I'll talk to Isaiah and hope about Patriot. I've got a number on Asgaridan's parents, so how much of the kid's story do you believe? asked Jessica as she twirled a pen between her fingers. Which one? About Kong or the confession? Kang's for now. Well, that kid's got the armor and technology, but do you really think he's the young Kong? The growing man seemed to recognize him, pointed out Daredevil as he leaned on the table. What if they're telling the truth? asked Steve as he looked at his fellow Avenger. He had to admit that the story was outlandish, but then again when Kong is involved, what isn't? They're kids, Cap. Even if Kong does show, but Iron Man wasn't able to finish his sentence, a voice cut him off. You know what they say gentlemen, speak of the devil, and the devil, he shall appear, exclaimed none other than Kong the Conqueror himself as he appeared in the room, armed to the teeth and smugly grinning at the three current and one former superheroes. Meanwhile, in the training room under the Avengers mansion, pressing her ear on the wall she waited a couple of seconds before taking ten paces and doing the same thing, then repeating the same thing. Nothing, muttered Laura with a frown. We are so dead, muttered Patriot. D, tell me you have something, pleaded the dark-skinned teen as he gazed at his elder teammate who had his ear pressed to the door. They ditched us, he said making the other six groan. I knew it, we shouldn't have trusted them, patriot, exclaimed Cassie. No, they said they'd train us and we've been stuck here for thirty minutes. They probably didn't believe us, began D as he sat on a large piece of concrete which had fallen from the roof. They're probably calling your parents to come and pick you up or something. They wouldn't do that, said Asgardian. Billy, come on. Billy, if you were Captain America, and you just caught the six fans that trashed St. Patrick's, what would you do? Patriot pointed a finger at Asgardian, who simply covered his face with his hand, muttering, We're so dead. Let's get out of here, said D as he popped his claws and stabbed the door in an attempt to cut through it, only to sigh and take his claws out. No good. The thing is too dense for me to cut through it and my magic will be no go as well. I am not that good at it. Billy? Can you make the door disappear? D. shouted Billy. Come on man, do you want your parents to find out you're a superhero? argued Patriot making Asgardian shake his head quickly. Then do something, make the door disappear, anything. Wait, you can make the door disappear? exclaimed Cassie as she looked at Asgardian with wide eyes. Well yeah but, it's complicated, he tried to explain while smiling shyly at the blonde girl. Now is not the time to argue guys. We have to focus on getting out of here first. Laura butted in and stopped an argument from arising as Patriot had furrowed his brows and was about to say something at Billy. Cassie. Began Kong as he took the younger girl's shoulders, you wanted to join the young Avengers, right? The girl nodded and he continued. Then how about as a first act as a young Avengers? you use your powers and get us out of here. Okay, but, how, if you grow, do you think you could shrink? If you could, you might be able to crawl under the door, the younger version of Kong explained. But then how I get you guys out, did anyone remember the code that Iron Man used? I did, said Kate as the door slid open to reveal the brunette girl standing in the doorway, smiling a little smugly. Come on we have to get out of here before the Avengers show up. Them and Kong. She muttered making all look at her strangely. What do you mean, them and Kong? Asked D as he led the group to the locker room area where they had previously left all their gear. When I left them, they were talking, okay first he was threatening to kill Jessica's unborn baby, he then shot Iron Man, Daredevil and Cap with his laser rifle, but when I left they were just talking. 
We have to get up there, exclaimed young Kong as he put on his armor. No you are not, stated Laura as she put her hand on her hips. She is right, Kang's here looking for you, said Hulkling. Don't worry guys, he's looking for, young Kong, and I'm Iron Lad. Iron Lad smiled as he put on his helmet. Then what are we waiting for? asked Kate making the other seven look at her strangely, not because of what she said, but because of what she was wearing. More specifically, the amount of weapons she had strapped on herself, a quiver of arrows and a bow, a sword and a pair of billy clubs, and Mockingbird's mask. Who are you supposed to be, Hawkingbird? joked Patriot as the rest walked out of the locker room. You'd better start being nice to me Patriot, or I'm not going to give you your present. Teased Kate as she took a bag off her shoulder and took out a tear-shaped, three-pointed shield with the American colors on it. A similar if not the exact same shield Patriot's grandfather had used during WW2. Your uniforms, they're different. Muttered Jessica as she looked at her two friends, their clothes and armor ripped or weathered out. Jess, so is yours, mumbled Cap as he looked at his longtime friend. My old jewel costume, it fits, but I'm pregnant, finished Jessica with a small voice as she fully realized what had happened. What did you do to my baby? She exclaimed as she lunged at Kong and gripped him around his neck tightly. If you want it back, you'll give me the boy. As I said, him not being in the time he belongs has fundamentally altered the timeline. The older version of Kong exclaimed. And the eight teens hiding behind a broken wall could only stare with horror as the once lively and vibrant city of New York was a smoldering ruin. Skyscrapers were either collapsed or were leaning on one another dangerously. All of this because Iron Lad did not want to become the monster that was Kong the Conqueror. They simply couldn't believe it. All right Kong. We'll give you the boy. They also couldn't believe Captain America's words. All eight teens watched the five adults agreed to condemn Iron Lad with horror while Dee and Laura watched with blank faces. I'm so sorry, Iron Lad, it's Oki Cass. No, it's not, argued the younger girl. The fact that Cap is just willing to hand you over to the most despicable man in Avengers history. Easy, Cass. Iron Lad is Kong, said Hulkling. Kong before he became Kong the Conqueror, reminded Laura as she walked in front, using her nose to pick up the adult's scent. And I intend to stay that way, I am not going to become that monster. But will you have a choice? Asked Dee making all stare at him. Time travel is hardly my specialty. You all know which that is. But you all saw how things were outside, all because you didn't become Kong in the future. So the mansion, Jessica's baby, the city, mumbled Kate. Yeah, then I'm sorry, Iron Lad, but maybe you should go back. Kate shouted both Hulkling and Cassie. I'm just saying, she held up her hands in a defensive gesture. Now is not the time for arguments. Laura's words quickly silenced them. First we need to find a safe place to hide and then we can discuss our next move. She's right, we're supposed to be a team, we stick together, and Iron Lad is not going anywhere, exclaimed Patriot. Does that mean I'm part of the team now? asked Kate with a sly smile. Don't push it muttered the dark-skinned super soldier. So which way do we go, left or right? asked Asgardian as he got the team back on their original objective of making their way out of the underground passages. We follow Iron Lad, said DX. This way, he pointed left with his thumb. According to the vision software, this corridor leads to a trapdoor that's directly in front of the gates. Iron Lad swallowed hard as he opened the man hatch that lead to the surface only to come face to face with a pist of jewel holding Kang's very big gun. I'm sorry Iron Lad. Apologized Jessica as she pointed the gun at the teens. Damn, they were against the wind, there was no way for us to sniff them out. Muttered DX as he and the rest of the team got out. A standoff ensued as the two groups glared at each other. I'm not going back, you have no choice, said Cap darkly. Trust me, this is a fight you won't win. He finished as Iron Man, Jewel and Daredevil came up to his side. The tension in the air was high, high enough so one could feel it by merely glancing at the two groups glaring at each other. For the 18s it was though. Before them stood not only Kong the Conqueror, a time-traveling warlord, but also four of their greatest heroes, ready to betray their principles and collaborate with their arch enemy. So you could say that all eight of them were nervous, but still, the dreaded question that they desperately wanted to avoid was nagging at them in the back of their minds, questioning them, weakening their resolve. 
What if they are right? A simple question, five words. The answer to that question meant the very past, present and future of their world. Though at the moment, there wasn't much left of it. Ruble and debris littered the streets of what remained of New York. The once vibrant and lively city was reduced to a graveyard and all eight teens knew why, because one of them didn't want to become an evil megalomaniac. All these and more thoughts ran through their minds as they stood stock still. Not wanting to show the fear that was creeping up their spines at them, well, not all. One of them, specifically a blonde 19-year-old with adamantium claws was hatching an escape plan at that very moment. Glancing to his left, one would mistake he was looking at the younger version of Kong, but they would be wrong for under his goggles. His glowing red eyes met the brown ones of Asgardian for but a second before the lighting wielder knew what he had to do. Okay Billy, you can do it. Focus just like D showed you, he thought as he began to mumble. The senior heroes saw this and braced themselves if the kids had planned something. Asgardian's eyes flashed blue for only a second. Billy, don't do anything foolish, son, shouted Captain America as he bended his knees slightly, but Billy ignored him as his eyes turned back to normal and all hell broke loose. Having gathered a small charge, DX rocketed so fast at the older generation of heroes that one would think he actually teleported. Reappearing in front of Jewel in mid-flight he surprised her by first spinning to the right and kicking the rifle out of her hands with his left foot and then used the spin he completed a 360 and hit her with his right foot in the solar plexus, sending her flying back into the ruble. As the cue was given, the other seven teens launched into action as Patriot launched himself forward and locked shields with Captain America in a tug of war. R-A-A-R-G-H, before he jumped to the side just as Hulkling came charging in. Cap was able to jump to the opposite side as well, avoiding the tackle, but what he didn't expect was for Hulkling's right arm to elongate and catch him in the throat. He crashed into the ground with a pained, oomph. Iron Man was in a similar predicament as Iron Lad almost tackled him before he was able to go airborne, quickly followed by the younger version of the Avengers' arc enemy. Kid, don't do this, he tried to reason. If I go back, billions will die, no good. I'm sorry then. He aimed his lasers at the teen and attempted to shoot him down. No, I'm sorry, but he had apparently forgotten that Iron Lad's suit of armor was just about, oh 1000 years more advanced than his. Iron Lad's ion blasts caught him square in the chest and he plummeted down to earth before the teen was able to catch him and set him down gently. As all this was going on, Asgardian and Kong were having a duel as lighting and ion blasts flew left and right, each one deflecting the other's attacks, no one able to gain an advantage. Kate on the other hand was using a large piece of wall for cover, she did not have the benefits of energy manipulation so entering the fray was practically suicidal, Cassie had also shrunk down and disappeared off to somewhere. At the same time, X-23 and Daredevil were having something resembling more of an acrobatic duel than an actual fight as each one dodged, avoided and twisted out of his, her opponent's attacks. That is until Laura sent a flying kick at Daredevil's head which he ducked, only to lose his footing as something fast, very fast, kicked them from under him with such force that he flipped in midair before landing on his stomach. Laura in the meantime had brought her foot down and spun on it, lifting her other foot in the air and delivering an axe kick on the back of Daredevil's head, knocking him out of the fight. Looking to her left, the corners of her lips twitched upwards as she nodded at DX who was still in a crouch after kicking Daredevil's feet from under him using his speed burst. Give it up Kong. It's over shouted Iron Lad as he aimed his ion lasers at his future self, the rest of his teammates were standing on his left and right, all surrounding Kong the Conqueror. You're right, it is. Taunted Kong as he extended his right hand in the armored teen's direction and with a flash of purple light from it, the lights on Iron Lad's armor glowed red as it moved on its own and fired its ion blasters at the nearest target, DX's face which was completely melted due to the close range of the blast. No, oh my god. What did you do? The scared teen spluttered as he watched his friend spawned on the ground, missing the front part of his skull. You did exactly what I wanted you to do, laughed Kong out loud as he issued more commands via his suit and into Iron Lads. A loud explosion soon followed downing the rest of the teens until only a still disbelieving Iron Land and Kong were left standing. Now then? Shall we go? Kong extended his hand as he smiled at the gobsmacked expression on Iron Lad's face. What have you done? He asked in a small voice. Make no mistake, this is your handiwork, the moment you arrived here, in this time. You endangered your friends and their world. 
The longer you stay here the more destabilized it becomes. Look around you. Kong made a sweeping motion with his hands to emphasize. Now come. He gestured forward as he pressed a button on his belt and opened a portal to the future. But before he could even turn around, Cassie suddenly appeared out of the ground, enlarging herself and pushing Kong right into the portal which closed behind him. Ha! She cheered as she turned around and hugged Iron Lad, it actually worked. Did I give you a reason to doubt me? said DX as he slowly rose up with help from Patriot, his face was still bright pink and the hair he had lost had not yet begun to regrow. I would just like to take a minute and thank you, D, for your thoughtfulness and forward thinking exclaimed Asgardian as he unzipped his shirt and detached a metal disc the size of his palm from the inside. Though the energy disruptor is fried, he sighed as he pocketed the small device that had probably saved his life, who knew what would happen if all of them didn't wear one. Hearing the all clear, the rest of the team quickly jumped to their feet, not even dazed by the ion blasts. It was experimental AIM technology, it's a good thing it worked the first time said X-23 as she examined her own smoking energy disruptor. Well mine didn't, muttered DX as he glared at the innocent metal disc before he threw it over his shoulder with a huff. Whoa, 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 you had these things on you and you didn't give me one? exclaimed Kate as she glared at the six young Avengers. Why do you think I jumped in front of you, muttered Patriot as he took his shield from the ground, Kate watching him with wide eyes. All right, then what was that thing Asgardian did? When he talked in our heads, she continued. I have a form of primitive telepathy, nothing big like some mutants, but I can speak to you through my mind by making eye contact, but quite frankly, I'm no good at it. DX scratched the back of his head as he looked away. That's why I sent the message to Asgardian, who then used his powers and acted much like a radio antenna, redirecting my plan to each and every one of you. He finished making Kate and Cassie eyes widen a little. The plan was simple just picking the correct pairs and opponents. The part with pushing Kong through the portal was a sign of good forward thinking and tactical analysis. Beside the whole Kong taking over Iron Lad's armor and attacking us, the plan was perfect as ever. Praised X-23 as she smiled at him which he returned. So what now? Asked Cassie. Kong is probably in the time stream on his way back here, and he'll keep coming until he gets what he wants. So what do we do? Wake up the Avengers asked Patriot as he dusted himself off. You mean the same Avengers we just totally beat up? chuckled Hulkling as he crossed his arms over his chest making Patriot sigh and mutter a, them. But if we do, they'll force Iron Lad to go with Kong, exclaimed Cassie. It's all right Cassie, I am going with him. Everyone paused in their activities to look at him in disbelief. What? You can't, he is right. All turned to stare at X-23 who had just spoken. She had crouched on the remains of a wall and was looking at them with a blank face. Look around you. Everything is in ruins and according to Kong, if Iron Lad returns to his timeline, all of this will be returned to normal. Wait, there has to be another way. We can figure something out, protested Patriot. No, yo, there is, I just thought about it, why would Kong go back and stop the event that made him Kong from ever happening? began dx as he walked in front of the other seven teens to gain their attention he wants to correct his mistakes he wants to set you iron lad on a path that will guarantee him success because if your future changes so does his and if you become kong the conqueror that would mean that there will be two conquerors which would end up badly for everyone meaning that if you truly do want to return and fix our present we have to kill kong he finished harshly making six of the seven teens flinch we will need a plan analyze kang's tactics and devise a strategy x-23's voice shook them out of their stupor and they quickly nodded in agreement still not 100 percent sure about the new plan of action that is exactly why we need to get out of here hulkling piped in as he grabbed iron lad's arm and dragged him away let's go to our home it is the closest said x-23 as he lead the group of eight away it doesn't matter where we go kong can track my armor Iron Lad tried one final protest. Then take it off. Smiled Kate as DX and Hulkling immediately grabbed parts of his armor and pulled them off. Kate is right, said Patriot as he went to help as well. Wait, did Patriot just admit? Kate left the question unasked as Laura and Cassie just nodded their heads. Without my armor I'm powerless, and a little underdressed, 
he finished with a blush since he was only wearing an under vest and a pair of boxers. Want my cape? joked Asgardian. Can we just get going? asked Patriot impatiently. Wait, what about Cap and the rest? said Cassie as she looked around for her late father's teammates. They're as good as dead, if you don't hand me the boy, shouted Kong from behind them as he held up Captain America by his hair and pointed a very large gun straight to his temple. Wait for us at my house, shouted Laura, but he'll kill them, the young Kong protested. Not if he's too busy defending himself, exclaimed Patriot as he got his shield into a ready position and Cassie grew twice her size. Now go. A bit reluctantly, the young Kong turned around and ran. This is it guys. No holding back, size changing, shape shifting. At that, Hulkling changed his entire left arm into something larger and much more scary looking. Claws, snicked. Eight pairs of claws were bared out and ready to rend their opponent. Spellcasting. Spellcasting? asked Kate as she unsheathed her sword. DX and I are still practicing, but yeah, and sometimes mine even work, confirmed Asgardian with a shrug. I'm done playing with you children, shouted Kong as he readied his weapon. Ain't that a shame? taunted DX. Guess what? He continued as he lifted his goggles to reveal bright red glowing eyes. So are we? At an unspoken command, all seven teens hurled themselves at Kong the Conqueror. At that moment all seven teens were pre-hyped up and ready to kick major ass, that is until they realized that not only did Nag have a very big gun, but he also had a shield that repelled all of their attacks. This is no good, take cover, shouted DX as he flipped back and avoided some of the gunfire while Patriot pushed Kate out of the way of the incoming fire. The situation didn't look very good for the teen heroes as Kong continued his relentless barrage of ion blasts. Leave the armor Patriot, even if you activate the vision software, Kong just needs to look at it and he has a bomb. Shouted Kate over the thunderous roar of Kang's gun as Patriot was attempting to activate Iron Lad's armor. He has 30th century technology, how are we going to beat him without Iron Lad's own tech? He shouted back as he ducked under a small mound of debris. Unknown to them. Iron Lad's discarded armor came to life as the central piece began to glow with light. Asgardian, you need to cast a spell, shouted X-23 as she ducked next to Patriot with a trail of ion shots trialing behind her. It's a little hard to concentrate when I'm being shot at, shouted back the brunette as he covered his head as a piece of the stone statue they were using for cover almost hit him as it fell. Patriot, X, Cassie, scatter and distract Kong shouted dx as x23 immediately jumped from her cover and ran as fast as she could the time traveling warmonger shooting at her back seeing his chance dx took a piece of piping and hurled it like a javelin at kang's shield the metal projectile harmlessly bounced off the third millennium tech shield and cluttered to the ground as kong swiveled around and started shooting at dx seeing his cue Patriot took a hefty sized piece of rock that easily weighed about 60 kilos and chucked it at Kong as Cassie shrunk and climbed on his shoulder, like his two teammates. Patriot ran like a man possessed the moment his enemy turned around to glare at him. Come on Billy, you can do it, said Hulkling as he, Kate and Asgardian were the only ones left at their cover. That's the point, I don't know what to say, shot back the brunette spellcaster. Don't focus on the problem, focus on what you want. That's how D described your powers, didn't he? Come on, you practiced with him a lot. I want to disable Kang's shield, muttered Asgardian. I want to disable Kang's shield, I want to disable Kang's shield, he began to chant as his voice became deeper. Good, encouraged him, Hulkling. Now imagine what it's gonna feel like when you disable Kang's shield. I want to disable Kang's shield, I want to disable Kang's shield, continued to chant Asgardian as he levitated in the air. Wow. Where did he learn that? A Wiccan manual? exclaimed Kate as she peered around the corner of the stone she and Hulkling were hiding behind. That, I don't know where DX found that thing, and one of my mom's self help books, it's incredible how that rubbish actually helps when you believe in it, explained Hulkling as he too peered around the corner of his hiding spot. But as they were talking, Asgardian was acting. I want to disable Kang's shield. I W A N T T O D I S S A B L E K A N N S. A bright, white light blinded all in the small clearing for a second before Asgardian was flung back a dozen meters to where Hulkling and Kate were. Okay. Only thing we need to do is take away his guns and he's done. 
exclaimed Cade as she took her bow and notched an arrow. Impossible! Shot back Asgardian as the trio quickly ducked under cover again when Kong got even angrier and focused his fire on them again. Kang's trans temporal armor allows him to pull any weapon in history out of the time stream. Then we'll have to take his trans temporal armor away, shouted Cade over the noise. How? We? But he was cut off as a figure materialized beside them, panting lightly. Kate! Huffed out DX as he steadied his breath, are you good with a bow? The best of the training team. Kate smiled back at him. Right, then make the shot count. He nodded his head as he ran from the cover and to the right of the other three, standing right in front of Kong, arms wide open. What is he doing? shouted Patriot from a distance as Kong grinned, aimed the gun at DX's chest, and pulled the trigger. It was hard for Kate to concentrate when someone was being ripped to shreds in front of her eyes, but she steeled her nerves and swallowed the bile that rose in her throat and released the arrow. With a thock, the arrow pierced Kang's armor on his left forearm, and electrical surges began to arc all around the time traveler, making him scream in pain as DX fell on his back with a thud, his body resembling Swiss cheese as his healing powers struggled to mend the damage. It's over, Kong, without your armor, you're powerless, exclaimed Patriot as he rushed the villain only to halt when his fist was stopped by Kang's own arm. Fwok! You underestimate me, boy! shouted Kong as he backhanded Patriot across his face, the team crumbled in a heap on the ground, his hand still in the older man's grip. Get away from him, shouted Kate as she pointed her sword at Kong. Haven't you done enough damage? You've destroyed my armor, stranded me at this moment in history and left me no means by which to restore the time stream. Not bad for a girl with no powers huh? chuckled Kate sarcastically as she lunged at the older man only for him to sidestep her attack and smack her on the back of her skull, making the brunette girl stumble and fall to the ground. You will tell me where the boy is, commanded Kong as he took Kate's sword and pointed it at her throat, fully intent to bury it in her jugular if she didn't answer him. Right here Kong, just leave my friends alone, shouted Iron Lad as he walked towards his older self, hands raised to show that he wasn't armed and still wearing nothing but his undershirt and a pair of boxers. Put the sword down and please don't hurt her, he begged as he made his way towards the downed girl. Iron lad, mumbled Kate as the teen helped he up to her feet. Look there is something you need to know, what is it? I'm not exactly iron lad, he whispered as he gave her a cheeky smile. In a second iron lad turned around and jumped from his crouched position, his form morphing and gaining bulk as well as changing color until Hulkling's massive form collided with Kong and sent him flying. Seeing her chance, Cassie enlarged herself and made a grab for Kong but the time traveler was too experienced and was able to grab hold of the discarded sword while still in mid-flight, turn around and slice Cassie's outstretched palm. That's it Kong, you're dead, shouted Patriot as he, Asgardian, Hulkling and X-23 charged the villain. The junior super soldier hurling a fistful of metal stars at him which were deflected. You children don't seem to realize, that if I die, so dies the world as you know it, so if anyone is to do the killing, it would be me," said Kong as he ducked under Hulkling's strike and tore a deep gash in his side, making the large teen stumble back in pain. I'm okay, I'll heal, muttered the green-skinned adolescent as he fell to one knee. I want to stop Kong I want to stop Ka and I want to stop, Asgardian began chanting as energy started gathering behind him. I don't usually enjoy killing children, but in this case, announced Kong as he prepared to hurl his sword into Asgardian's chest, that is until a yellow energy beam collided with his back and sent him face first into the ground. All eyes whipped to see who had shot Kong and were shocked at the one who was floating before them. I am. Vision. The green and yellow, red-faced robot exclaimed as he floated closer to the time-traveling warmonger. You have been identified as Kong the Conqueror. Vision said as he phased to allow Kang's blade to pass through him harmlessly. A time-traveling warlord from the 30th century. You do not belong here, Vision continued as he shot a laser beam from his eyes that his Kang's sword, wrenching it out of his grasp and flinging it some distance away. Return to your era at once, finished Vision as he began to lightly choke Kong. I act, I intend to. Kong smiled despite his predicament, reached out with a hand and pressed two buttons on Vision's neck immediately deactivating him and allowing Kong to regain control of his armor. Now I will only ask once before I start killing. 
exclaimed Kong as he pulled out two very large guns from the time stream. Where is Iron Lad? Behind you, hearing the voice, Kong quickly whirled around, Shunk, only for a very familiar jagged claw to be embedded into his face. Erg, thump, falling onto his back, Kong the Conqueror was dead. The five teens looked on in wonder and awe as X-23 stood in a crouching position, her hand still extended from the throw as Iron Lad, young Kong, helped DX up to his feet, the blonde's knees were still jelly. Literally speaking about his right one and his left hand had only one of his wrist blades was extended and blood gushed from where the other one should extend. D, your claw, you, ripped it out? Stuttered Hulkling as he pulled the adamshium covered claw from Kang's forehead with a grimace. My body works differently, maybe I'll explain some other time, DX smiled albeit with pain as he took his blade from Hulkling's hand and in a flash of red light, it disappeared. Snicked. There, see? Good as new. He showed them that indeed the blade that had killed Kong was now in its place. They're fading, muttered Patriot. Cap and Jess and Iron Man and Kong even Daredevil. And indeed they were, vanishing before their eyes. The time stream is repairing itself. Everything will be fine, trust me, assured him Iron Lad. Guys, the mansion. It's back, said Kate and indeed, the mansion, the yard, heck all of New York was back as it was just an hour ago. Well the mansion was actually missing the giant hole made by the growing man but that was something that went unnoticed. Not quite, Hulkling was the bearer of bad news as he directed everyone's gazes at the memorial statue of the six founding Avengers. Oh my god, they're all dead, muttered Kate as she looked over each of the tombstones line in front of the memorial statue. This can't be happening, whispered Asgardian in disbelief. It already happened. What do we do? asked Cassie, her voice filled with concern. The only thing we can do, Iron Lad, Patriot turned to the other brunette in the team who quickly waved his hands in front of him in a negative manner. Patriot, no, you don't know what you're asking of me. At this point I'm not asking. Patriot continued gravely as he took of his mask. You have to go back in time. You have to become Kong the Conqueror, if you don't. Eli, exclaimed Cassie. My dad's grave, it's not here. What if he's still alive? asked the blonde girl as hope found its way into her eyes. See that's the problem with time travel, said DX. For all we know, the present and future we just created is a better one that we left behind. That means it is possible right, that he is still alive? Cassie shot up and looked at the oldest of the group. But with the Avengers gone, your father may have never met your mother, you may have never been born, cut in Asgardian, all eyes suddenly focus on Iron Lad the group's resident time traveler. It's possible, but, and he's not the only one, mumbled X-23 as she too stood up after examining the graves of the now fallen heroes. According to the Vision's files, both Billy and Teddy are somehow related to the Avengers and with them dead, she let her words in spoken as the group pondered on this new information. Iron Lad, began DX as he walked towards the teen's armor and picked it up. You said that you would return to the future in order to repair the past not ten minutes ago. In order for the timeline to be repaired, you must go back. With Kong dead, there is no more treat. Finished the blonde with a frown as he extended his hand and held up Iron Lad's armor. Said teen just looked at the ground and refused to make eye contact with the rest of his teammates. Kong said his armor can send you into the future. Said Patriot as he took another piece of it from the ground and approached Iron Lad. I'm not going back. Not yet. Iron Lad snapped back angrily. Then we'll reactivate the vision and have him send you back. Billy will cast a spell so you can forget that this ever happened, and you'll return to your time and everything will be fine. Eli, what the, hell? All the teens suddenly whipped around and gasped in horror as Hulkling looked himself over with horror-filled eyes as he began to fade away. Help, me, and just like that he was gone, vanished, never even born. Iron Lad thought it all over and over in his head. What if he stayed? What if he went back? Would all be well? Would everything be as it once was? Was the damage too much already? It was meant to be, he thought to himself sadly as he stood up. Billy, quickly, do the spell. Oh, no, but before the spell caster could even move a muscle, it was over, just like that, before their eyes, Asgardian vanished into nothingness as well. Billy! shouted Patriot to no avail as his friend was gone as well, the rest were rooted to their places as well, not able to believe what just happened. 
No, no. Iron Lad fell to his knees as he continued to mumble to himself. Refraining herself from crying, Cassie put a hand on his shoulder to try and comfort him even if a little. It's okay. Everything will be fine, but you have to go now, she now began to openly cry. I know, hold the armor for me Eli, I can't take it with me or it will affect the time stream, D, you're telepathic right? And you do spells too, Iron Lad got up to his feet and gave the rest a sad look. I will try my best, muttered D as he gathered some of his energy into his palms, put them on the brunette's temples and looked him straight in the eyes. After several seconds he nodded without saying a word and backed up a bit to give his friend and teammate some space. Now to activate the vision, I am the vision. Kang's 30th century armor morphed for several seconds to reveal form of the vision, son of Ultron and one of the Avengers in all his bright colored glory. Vision, I need you to use the armor's chronal programming to open a portal that will send me home. The coordinates should be on file. Searching, coordinates locked, chronal portal activated. Extending his hand, Vision shot out a purple beam from his palm which morphed into a portal to the future. One last thing. Vision turned his head to look at the brunette who was right beside him. Take good care of my friends. I'm sorry Eli, for everything, he shook hands with the black teen. D, Laura, I am happy to call you friends, even if I won't remember you, the trio shook hands with sad eyes. It was a very heart-clenching moment when Cassie and Iron Lad embraced and shared a small kiss before it was finally time for him to return to his time. I just want you guys to know that I loved being a young Avenger, were his last words as he gave them a small wave which they all returned before it was over and he was gone in a bright flash of light. Our uniforms, Cassie was the first to notice the change, or rather lack of it as all looked around to take in their surroundings. We're still young Avengers. Does that mean it didn't work? That Iron Lad didn't grow up to become Kong? If I interpret it correctly, began Laura. Everything happened just as it was supposed to and the time stream is as it should be. Which means that Iron Lad returned back to his right time and that Kong the Conqueror is dead. You're right! exclaimed Kate making all look at her. It's the way it was before Kong showed up. And she was right, not only was the mansion a wreck, but so was the garden and the memorial statues. All the scars from the day the Avengers were dismembered were once again present. That blue light, pointed out DX as he took off in a run, the rest trekking behind him, once they reached the mansion itself they all breathed a sigh of relief as they saw their two missing teammates and the four heroes picking themselves up from the rubble. Eli, is Iron Lad, Hulkling left the question unspoken, for there was no reason to ask it, it was painfully obvious. He went back. And now it seems that everything that happened after Kong showed up never happened. So how do we remember it? Asked Asgardian. See, this is why I hate time travel, muttered Jessica as she got up from the ground with some help from Cap. Come on, let's get you kids home, said the American icon, but the teens had something else on their minds. And after that? Asked Laura as she took of her face mask and pocketed it, what then? Yeah, you still wanna draw on us? continued Patriot with sarcasm. Or were you just said that so we wouldn't use our powers to stop you from calling our parents? The dark-skinned teen lifted his shield into a defensive position while Asgardane gathered some lighting into the palms of his hands and DX balled his fists by his sides, an all too familiar gesture to those who know his predecessor. Because we could you know, Patriot left the treat and spoken as the teen heroes glared at their older counterparts who frowned in response. Avengers Mansion, Dining Room a few minutes later, all were again seated around the dining table. While all but Iron Man and Vision were seated, the former examining every inch of the robot with a critical eye only found on a genius inventor such as Tony Stark. In my opinion, began Captain America, you kids have more than proven yourselves heroes tonight. But, asked the four male members of the Young Avengers simultaneously. But, if you ever put those uniforms ever again, me and Iron Man will do everything in our power to shut you down for good. His words hit the teen heroes hard, well most of them. While the others were saddened by the turn of events, DX and X-23's faces were unreadable and blank, completely devoid of emotion. But, we could help, you could train us, pleaded Cassie. We can't. Not without your parents' consent, explained Iron Man as he continued to examine the new vision. But if you want us to ask your parents, he need not continue as the faces of teens dropped, except the two former living weapons. 
Laura's mother had already given her consent with their decision and would stand by them, but for the rest, well. Um, that's okay, I should probably be going. Me too, anybody need a lift? Cassie? Yeah, home sounds good, hold on, Cap cut them off before they could even make a step. All your gear, all the stuff you borrowed, the bow, the shield, the sword, the throwing stars, leave them here. A bit reluctantly, all the teens relinquished their equipment and left the Avengers mansion. We're doing the right thing, asked Cap as he turned around to look at his comrades whose faces were set in stone, aren't we? Outside. Well, it was fun while it lasted, muttered Hulkling. It's not over yet, quipped Kate. Yeah, after a long investigation, S.H.I.E.L.D. will have all our newly made files in the future MetaHuman Recruits folder. DX offered a piece of humor, though whether it was sarcasm or just his lack of understanding of humor, the others will never know. Um, didn't mean that, deadpanned Kate as she stared the blonde 19-year-old. Well he wasn't, that is what will happen, said Laura as the others turned to look at her. Trust us, we are right, she assured them in a serious tone again making the others wonder if it was sarcasm or lack of understanding of the word, joke. Well anyway, Cap said he wouldn't train us, so why can't we train on our own? You said it yourself that ever since Dee and Laura had joined the team, they've been training you all the time, explained Kate. She attempted to make the others see her point, to realize that many people could use their help, but the rest weren't so convinced. They were still worried about their parents finding out. You know what guys? Cut her off D as he and Laura headed off to their flat. Why don't we talk about this tomorrow or in several days, let's sleep on it first. And it was a plan, since the others agreed to meet tomorrow at a nearby park and discuss their hero carriers further. Ten minutes later, outside of the Kinney's apartment. Wait, D raised his hand indicating for Laura to stop, though it wasn't necessary as she too had detected the new smell coming from inside their apartment. Turning around to see her face. She nodded at him and they both took another sniff of the air. No blood, said the blonde, he smells of beer and tobacco. Laura scrunched her nose as the unpleasant smells bombarded her sensitive nose. No sounds of struggle, go in? He asked her, she in turn took her key out and unlocked the door, slowly opening it. Entering the apartment, the first thing which their eyes landed upon was the visitors, intruders ruffled up, leather cowboy hat. Sharing a look, the two former assassins slowly walked towards the kitchen where both Sarah's and the late night guest smells were the strongest. Upon entering it they got a good glimpse of the man. Checkered button-up shirt, blue jeans, leather boots that seemed to have seen a lot of travel. A toothpick between slightly elongated teeth, predator's grin, short stubby bear and a very weird hairdo. Hey kiddos. The man greeted with a wave of his hand, both teens stared at him. D, Laura, this is Logan although you would know him as, Wolverine, explained Sarah with a nervous smile as Wolverine's grin only broadened. So, what's this I hear on the news about some minimes running around town? The very much older man asked with a chuckle making both teens look at each other slightly nervously. Not good? Asked D as he sent a telepathic message to Laura as they made eye contact. Unable to answer telepathically, the Weapon X clone just shook her and thought to herself. Not at all. Two weeks later, even though winter was coming, the sky was blue and the sun was unusually hot, even in a city like New York the birds were singing, well in the parks at least, it was a relatively calm and boring day. WHO? Until that, wait, 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 let me get this straight, exclaimed Teddy Altman, a large blonde teen with several earrings wearing baggy jeans and a white button-up shirt. Two weeks ago, on the night when the whole mess back at Avengers Mansion blew, you got a surprise visit by none other than Wolverine himself. The question was directed at two teens with somewhat gothic appearance. The raven haired, green eyed girl was wearing a leather miniskirt with knee high boots and a tube top, all in pitch black, with a choker around her neck and a biker jacket. While the older blonde male was wearing black leather pants, army style boots, a black shirt and leather vest along with wrist wrappings and sunglasses. And as for the question, their answer was a simple nod. Okay, so what did you talk about? asked Billy Kaplan, who was wearing a simple t shirt and blue jeans along with a pair of tennis shoes. Well, the blonde, D began as he took a deep breath, he just wanted to get to know us, he half smiled awkwardly. At 3 a.m., asked Kate Bishop, 
Her clothes consisted of her school uniform and a black jacket she wore over it. Yes, we commented on that as well, though he just chuckled and ignored the question, continued the blonde. We didn't talk much though, seeing as how late it was. He did invite us to go to the Xavier Institute, he, but was cut off when a black skinned clean shaved teen by the name of Eli Bradley choked on his drink and looked at the two former assassins with wide eyes before he spoke. What do you mean he invited you to go to the Xavier Institute, he asked you to come by and visit or enroll? To enroll, and we accepted, said Laura, the leather clad girl sitting beside the blonde in black who was cut off in mid sentence. What? The other five teens shouted in unison, making many people look at them. I know it's difficult for you, but understand our reasons, said D as he stood up and walked up to the other five. For Laura, it is the chance to meet her, older brother, he asked as he looked at the raven haired girl who just nodded, the others making weird faces. And some of the most powerful telepaths in the world live in the Xavier Institute, they could help me regain some of my lost memories, find out who I was finished D as he looked into the eyes of his friends who all bowed their heads. It's all right. Began Cassie Lang, the daughter of the late Ant-Man. We understand. It's a big thing for you guys. She finished with a small smile which the two former living weapons mimicked. So when do you leave? Asked Kate. Next Sunday, the coming Monday will be our first day there. Or at least until Logan returns from Japan on personal business so he could take us there. He left the morning after we met explained Laura as she got up and dusted her behind. Then that leaves us a whole week for some fun, continued Kate as she brightened up. What do you mean? Only to palm her face as all the commotion around Wolverine's visit had caused, she had forgotten her proposition. What I mean is for you guys to consider for us to continue being young Avengers. She saw that Eli, Teddy and Billy were hesitating while Cassie was frowning at them. She had been very enthusiastic about Kate's proposition when the two had first talked several days ago. Then at least let's do it for Dee and Laura, they will be going away for God knows how long, what do you guys say we kick some bad guy ass, the seven of us, before they have to leave? That got their attention. It was settled, the young Avengers, after a two week long pause, were back. In a shield helicarrier, location. Unknown, I must say, Wolverine, you're not looking too good, honey. Those Hydra guys sure did a number on you. The lovely black lady commented as she checked up on my condition. Antiseptics stink. Footsteps squeaking on hard waxed floor. Starched linen sheets, hospital, who is this? Don't you remember? Pheromones pumping, pupils dilating. I think she knows me. Three or four years back. The Scorpio mission? That number you gave me was a fake you jackass? She spoke quietly, slowly. I called the next day and you know what I got. The Fantastic Four reception desk, I can laugh about it now but. Kill her, what? Kill her, you have to get out of here. What? Here's where you make the cuts. No mess. No fuss. Circles, crosshairs suddenly appeared in my vision, the jugular and right in the heart. Just a quick clean kill and then you can. Uh, Wolverine? Are you okay? Fine. Absolutely fine. Never better. Listen you'll feel dizzy for a while. I got you enough drugs to tranquilize the Hulk, but you're doing okay. Your healing factor was pushed to the limit by whatever happened in the Hydra camp, but everything important seems to be stitching itself together anyway. Like an autopsy in reverse. I know, I know, I can feel it all slithering into place. Public relationship says you're wearing that costume again. My costume? Ah, oh, the blue and yellow one hanging on the wall. Mutants just look scary in the black and leather biker gear. Dressing up like superheroes makes you so much less threatening to people. Stay away from me lady, I can smell it in your scent, hear it in your voice. Wire 2. Please. Don't do this. There's something really wrong with me right now. Something isn't, right here. Kill her. Shut up. Kill her, you idiot. Your Hydra mission started the second you opened your eyes. All she's doing is wasting your time. You want a drink or something, Wolverine? Your lips look awful dry. Kill her. Snicked. Two hours later. Um, Laura, this wasn't what I had in mind, muttered Kate as she massaged the bridge of her nose in frustration. The seven super powered vigilantes were currently hauled up in the attic of the Kinney's flat and were seated around several laptops and computers, as police data from their hacked network was pouring over the screens. While Laura was operating the host PC, the others were searching for the 
action as it is. It was pretty cramped but thankfully, Hulkling had returned to his normal self and Cassie aka stature, had shrunk to about one foot tall and was laying on top of Kate's head, much to the brunette's ire. It would be pointless to simply run around New York, searching for criminals or people in need. And it's Sunday which means we need to check up on S.H.I.E.L.D., explained Laura as she typed several commands and data from the top secret organization started flooding the PC screens. Whoa, there are things here so secret, that the president doesn't know about him, muttered Teddy in awe. Like what? Chuckled Billy as he and Dee were currently levitating about a meter from the ground, keeping a dampening field around the building so S.H.I.E.L.D. would have no idea who is hacking their network, even should the AIM hacking software fail. Whoa, it says here that an S.H.I.E.L.D. light aircraft carrier was just sunk, by Wolverine, shouted Teddy as everyone in the room suddenly rushed over to his spot to confirm his exclamation, dampening field be damned. Says here he was found unconscious in a ditch in Argentina, then when he woke up, he downloaded the entire S.H.I.E.L.D. database and sunk the ship, a lot of people ended up dead, they suspect that the hand in Hydra to be involved. Wow, muttered Eli the teens backed away from the PC and gave Teddy some space. Last known whereabouts, Eastern Seaboard, he's coming back to New York, said D as he got into a thinking position. What makes you think that? asked Cassie, portraying the thoughts of the rest except Laura. I've fought the hand, so has Laura. Their specialty is eliminating the target, and then using an ancient ritual to revive the dead and make them their slaves. And if there is suspicion of Hydra being involved, that it's almost a hundred percent true. Explained D as Teddy, Billy, Eli, Cassie and Kate stared at him. So wait, Wolverine is a zombie now? Asked Billy as he raised an eyebrow. No, not a zombie, he has been revived and most likely brainwashed. Which means that what they want, he will do it. Said Laura as she continued to scan the data on her PC screen. Something big is about to go down and Wolverine is involved in it, as well as the greatest terrorist organization in the world and the most feared assassin cult out there. Muttered D as he paced back and forth, trying to fix the pieces together. Here it is! exclaimed Laura, gaining the attention of all the gathered teens. Shield decoders have just cracked a file that they got from the hand, it's a meta human hit list. All of the top superheroes in New York are the targets. She turned the PC monitor so all could see the indeed, people like the Fantastic Four and members of the Avengers were among the targets. So what do we do? asked Teddy as he glanced at the two former assassins, searching for an answer. First of all you guys need to lay low. This is Wolverine and he is out there to kill, you can't stand up to him. The tone of Dee's voice made it so that no protests could be voiced. I and Laura together will be able to handle him, but we will have to make the first move. In the meantime, Billy, I need your help with the teleportation crystals I have been trying to make. Oh man. This is such a buzzkiller, muttered Teddy as he leaned back in his seat with a groan. Better a buzzkiller than us getting killed man, I for one do not want to have a go with Wolverine. Guess we better change EH, said Cassie as she returned to her original size and took the bag where her normal clothes were. The rest followed him as they changed into their normal day clothes except for Dee and Laura who remained dressed for a fight, in case Wolverine decided to show up. The same night, Baxter Building home of the Fantastic Four. Johnny Storm sighed for what must be the hundredth time this evening. The code read that S.H.I.E.L.D. had issued to all capes had been a real bummer. Great, just what I need, Wolverine coming after my ass, thought the human torch as he lay under his vintage car, fixing the crankshaft that had been making a lot of noise. Of all the people it had to be Wolvie, the blonde thought bitterly as images of the short Canadian, stalking in the darkness flooded his mind. Now I'm getting paranoid, I shouldn't worry, Reed initiated a lockdown, we're good, we're good, we're good, he repeated the mantra in his head as he ranched on. Not seeing the metal glint in the ventilation shaft. Ten minutes later. Rooftop adjacent to the Baxter building. He can teleport, shift his visual spectrum and change his voice to issue verbal overwrites. X-23 counted off as she sat cross-legged with a laptop in her lap connected to a sphere-like machine suspended by a small stand. Her black and gray spandex clinging tightly onto her form. I wasn't able to spot where he and the human torch landed, we should assume he already left the premises. Replied DX as he pressed a button on the right side of his goggles and zoomed out. His uniform had changed, as he no longer wore the overly bulky pair of boots he used to have. 
Now he wore a pair of more simpler boots, along with his black and gray uniform. We have all the data we need to formulate a plan to take him down when he next shows up, said X-23 as she closed her laptop and packed the sphere-like computer that allowed them to infiltrate practically every network in the world with little to no difficulty. We need to disable his teleportation ability, once we take that away, we will be able to take him down, but I didn't spot anything on him, not even a hip pouch. Confirmed the blonde as he took a red crystal the size of his palm and used his power to make it levitate an inch above it. Implants? Asked X-23 as she walked next to him and laid a hand on his shoulder. Floosh! And they were gone in a bright red light, leaving behind a handful of red dust to drift in the wind. Most likely. Your mother may help us disable them. Disable what? Asked Sarah Kinney as she climbed the stairs to the attic, still wearing her doctor's uniform having been alerted of their arrival due to the light show. Wolverine has been brainwashed by Hydra, they've enchased him with implants that make him several times more dangerous. The only way to stop them is by disabling his enhancements. Explained Laura as she took off her mask and approached her mother. Sarah thought for a moment and then nodded her head, she looked at the two teens and then began to walk back and forth, plans already beginning to form in her head. I got it, she exclaimed. I just need a blood sample from you. Laura, then I need to get rid of the 2% difference in it so it will resemble Wolverine's blood perfectly. After that, I could introduce nanites to the sample, I will need to bond them carefully in order for the nanites to not get filtered by his healing factor, that way when we inject him with the bioagent, the specially designed nanobots will attack any implant he may have, no, better yet make it so that they jam them, otherwise they could be confused by his adamantium skeleton and be rendered useless. Explained Sarah as she waved her hand in a small circle before she frowned. Even with the tech we have here, it won't be enough. She glanced up at them, silently saying everything. I'll make the call. Mumbled D as he accepted Laura's backpack and hooked the AIM hacking computer back to their own network. Shield Helicarrier, high above New York. Nick Fury suddenly stiffened when his comm unit beeped three times. It never did that, even when someone was calling. Excuse me Mr. President. I must take an important call. Apologized the commander of Shield as he stood up after the president of the USA nodded at him and walked to the opposite of the room, he could barely hear his second in command brief the president on the current situation as he turned on his communicator. Who is this? He asked rather harshly. A friend Colonel Fury, we wish to help you with your problem. The voice of a young adult came through the line and Fury's eyebrows furrowed in annoyance. I ask again, who the hell are you? He hissed into his earpiece. Ask Mr. Rogers, the three of us will be waiting for you to pick us up in front of the Avengers mansion, you should not ignore us Colonel Fury as you need all the help you can find. The young man spoke in a neutral tone, not at all intimidated by the one-eyed man's harsh words. Help with what? young man he wasn't stupid he already had an idea of who the teen on the other end of the line was and what his proposition entitled but he needed confirmation with capturing wolverine of course colonel fury we will be waiting the line went dead as the mysterious caller cut the connection nick would have a nice long chat with steve rogers that was a given what he wanted an answer to most however was how two kids had hacked his earpiece communicator of all things without triggering any sort of alarm or warning this was shield after all, such things should be impossible, yeah right, thought Fury angrily as he strolled back to the US president to explain the newest turn of events. Ten minutes later, Nick Fury was standing beside Steve Rogers aka Captain America and several other people, waiting for the transport he had sent to land so he could grade his newest guests and get some damn answers. The things he heard from Cap were both good and bad, the kids were full trained assassins, the fact that they both had an advanced healing factor, better than wolverines along with adamantium claws was a plus they were assassins created and trained to outdo the short canadian was a plus too somewhat the fact that their past involved a lot of killing was a big no-no then again shield 2 had hired the expertise of a former assassin of the hand so the problem was up for debate with a loud hiss the transport craft landed and lowered its ramp to allow several shield soldiers to walk out followed by the three passengers after the all clear was given, the two men walked forward to greet them. Good evening ma'am, Colonel Nick Fury, Director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Colonel Fury shook the hand of the middle-aged raven-haired woman who smiled at him. Sarah Kinney, this is my daughter Laura, 
she pointed at the younger girl who was still wearing her mission outfit, minus the domino mask. And D. She pointed at the blonde 19-year-old who lifted his goggles onto his forehead. Are you related? Asked Fury as he raised an eyebrow at the blonde. No, I just take care of him. She smiled at D's direction before turning to look straight into the colonel's eyes once again. Allow me to introduce you to Captain America. The grizzled man moved aside to allow the American Idol to make his acquaintance with Sarah. It is good to see you again Captain, said Laura softly as she smiled at Cap's direction, who frowned slightly. Yes well, with the introductions done, I would like to get down to business. Colonel Fury's voice gathered everyone's attention as the small group walked back into the helicarrier and to find a more secluded room where a plan could be worked on. So, you say that you can engineer a gas or vaccine that would neutralize all of Hydra's implants that Wolverine's been stuffed with? Asked Nick as he watched the raven-haired woman with a raised eyebrow. Yes, I've worked extensively with his genetic samples and if given the needed equipment I can do that. All I need is access to your lab and I can create the specific nanites that we will be using against Wolverine. Explained Sarah as she crossed her arms over her chest and leaned back into her seat. Thinking it over for several moments, Colonel Fury nodded his head and spoke. All right Dr. Kinney, you'll get all the materials and access you need. Just make the damn thing. He glanced to where the two former living weapons were seated. Is there anything you wish to add? Yes. Began D. I and Laura have thought of a plan to apprehend Wolverine when Mrs. Kinney finishes the bio-agent. Cap and Fury stayed silent to allow the blonde to explain his plan of action to apprehend Wolverine. The plan is fairly simple. Began D as he took his discarded backpack which he had brought with him and opening it, revealed it to be filled with red, rhombus-shaped crystals the size of his palm. A little sand, a little glass and some of my magic and I can make one-time use teleportation crystals. With them I can go anywhere I want, the range is only hindered by the amount of power I use. The delay until teleportation is about 15 to 20 seconds and one must be in a 2 meter radius to the crystal in order to teleport. He took one of the crystals and demonstrated by charging it up with his power, making it glow brightly. After about 15 seconds, D in his chair had teleported right beside Colonel Fury, the blonde's palm now full of red sand. Nick was officially impressed. Why shouldn't he be? The moment S.H.I.E.L.D. is faced with its greatest crisis since, that's up for debate, and all of a sudden a solution practically falls in their open arms. D didn't need to continue to explain his plan. Fury was smart, of course. It had all clicked in the aged colonel's head. Simple and damn effective. One super team using those crystals will drop right on top of his head, Fury smiled and was still able to keep his face serious which was quite a feat. I guess that you and X-23 will be going? The blonde nodded and so did the colonel. Well Cap will be accompanying you and so will one other person, speak of the devil. The last part Fury said loudly as he turned in his chair to welcome the woman who had just entered the room. She had black, long, curly hair, a bodysuit that looked like a one-piece swimsuit along with high boots and a trench coat. So colonel, what's this all about? Asked none other than Electra. We have a plan how to take down Wolverine, Ms. Nachios. Speaking of which, how long will it take you to create the bio-agent Dr. Kinney? Fury turned his chair again to look at Sarah who looked up and tilted her head to the side a little in thought. I should be able to get the easy part done tonight. The hard part will be to integrate the nanites that will render his enchantments useless into his blood. If I don't do it right, his healing factor will neutralize the nanites before they are able to do their purpose. She explained. Finishing, Fury nodded once curtly and asked for someone to lead her to the lab where she could begin work. The plan colonel? Asked Electra as she plopped down in one of the chairs around the table and switched her gaze towards the two teens. And who are they? Those two are the plan. Electra, I would like you to meet DX and X-23, said Fury as he pointed at the two teens. They will help us take down Wolverine. Really? Asked Electra a bit skeptically. She had gone against Wolverine before and she knew what it took to take someone like him down. And quite frankly, she didn't think the two teens had it in them, snicked. On the other hand, the four pairs of claws really helped to turn her opinion around. Wow, I don't even want to know how you got those since I already have a pretty good idea, she mumbled the last part as her eyes took. The claws said a lot, the girl's claws were sleek and resembled Wolverine's, while the blonde's claws were bigger, they were jagged and looked very dangerous. From what she could see about their bodies, 
The raven-haired girl was petite and agile, built for elegance in combat, evasion and precision. The boy on the other hand was obviously older so his muscles were much more defined, he was built strong, no fat, only muscle. Though they still weren't overly bulky, his muscles were every man's dream. His build just screamed power, simple as that. I'm listening. She smiled in their direction before turning to face the colonel. All was going according to plan. His plan was coming along perfectly. In a large room filled with various monitors, from small 17 inch PC screens to giant 2 to 3 meter LCDs, the room had a lot of them. And in front of them all stood a man, who had just thrown the dice. Contact AIM. Tell them we now have a disc containing Dr. Richards's most radical ideas and that we would like for them to begin constructing these concepts as weapons. His tone was sharp yet betrayed his advanced age. Contact the hand. Tell them we wish to redouble our efforts to infiltrate the superhuman community and create 10 new super agents within the next 7 days. He continued to give out orders as his adjutants saluted and rushed to fulfill their commander's will. Then I want you to find Wolverine and bring him in. I want him retooled and ready for a brand new assault on Tony Stark and the American banking industry. Hydra's secret bankroller arrives at midnight, tonight, I want everything ready before she gets here, said Baron Wolfgang von Strucker, the supreme Hydra commander. The next day, in front of Stark International. The morning was crisp and the wind chilly, one would wonder how yesterday could have been such a warm and sunny day when storm clouds were now blanketing New York. But winter was coming in the Big Apple which made the whole atmosphere even more unpleasant. Nick Fury, Electra, Dee and Laura were currently dressed in trench coats and walking among the wreckage caused earlier that morning, by Wolverine and no less than 100 Hydra agents. Several dozen more S.H.I.E.L.D. agents were scouring the area for survivors. They've upped their game. Mumbled Dee as checked over one of the dead guards of Stark Industries. This is not how Hydra operates, he said loudly as he stood up. True, whatever they're planning, they're going all out, sighed Colonel Fury as he looked around the mini war zone. Whatever it is, Wolverine is one ace too many for them. When will the bio agent be ready? asked Electra as she crossed her arms over her chest, her eyes taking in every detail of her surroundings behind her dark glasses. Colonel Fury was about to respond, but one of his agents cut him off just as he opened his mouth. What? exclaimed Fury, not believing his ears. Wolverine took down Spider Man. We dug his body out 20 minutes ago!" exclaimed the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent as he began to give Fury and Electra a complete rundown on the events that had taken place earlier in the morning, his report speeded up with video footage taken from the security system and eyewitness reports. In the meantime, Dee and Laura had walked to where Spider-Man laid covered by a white sheet, a large red stain over his abdomen. Tried out best to patch him up, but there was nothing connected in there anymore. Got him walking for a minute, but even he had given up explained the paramedic as she uncovered his face. That's not Spider-Man. That's the Hornet, exclaimed Laura, though she still kept her face neutral. Her voice was loud enough to attract the attention of her superiors, who quickly strolled by the teen's side. Geez, muttered Fury. Guy goes down in the line of duty and no one even bothers to remember his name. What are you doing? The last part was directed at Electra who had unbuttoned her trench coat and had pulled out a katana holding it in a ready position. Hydra is allied with the hand, Colonel. Dislocating that man's brain from his spinal column is the only way we can remove the corpse as a potential terrorist treat. She raised her katana in a stance, ready to lop the dead man's head off, but halted when D, who was still crouching by the corpse, raised his arm to stop her. Perhaps his family would want his body in a relatively good condition, snicked. Allow me, he said as he ejected one of his wrist blades lifted the man's head and dug the claw into the back of his neck. It's done. He stood up and retracted his claw as the medics took the man into one of the waiting ambulances. See Electra, Hydra may have one ace, but we have three. Fury smiled grimly at the ex-assassin of the hand as he gestured at her and the two teens standing behind her. Later that night. What are you thinking about? The young adult blonde turned his head to look at the girl who was now leaning beside him on a guard rail on the balcony of the communication tower on SHIELD's helicarrier. Honestly, of how our fight with Wolverine might go. Even with people like Elektra and Captain America, our success is not guaranteed, we have not worked as a team before and he could exploit that. Explained the blonde as he watched at the night sky. 
True, but I have never seen you so troubled about anything. Does Wolverine scare you by any chance? The right side of her mouth twitched upwards as he turned around to look at her, his right eyebrow raised and the right corner of his mouth raised upwards. Hey, you're right, I'm not worried about Wolverine, I know we can take him down. I'm worried about the truth, he said cryptically. The truth? She asked, waiting for him to enlighten her. The truth about Hydra, AIM, Shield. The truth is that, he suddenly focused on the landscape, or more specifically, the fact that New York had just went dark. What happened? Asked D the moment he entered SHIELD's main intelligence room where all of the agency's operations were conducted or monitored. I was just about to ask the same thing, replied Colonel Fury as he turned to an agent who was holding a data pad. Sir, all three power stations central Manhattan just went down. It's Wolverine. Freak sent us a warning 30 seconds setting off a low-powered electromagnetic pulse and says he's moving the game to a whole new level. The man read the data to his superior and the two teens. What does that mean? Asked the colonel flatly, he says he wants a big name partner. Matt Murdock's place, Daredevil's pad. Swanky four-story brownstone in the heart of Hell's Kitchen. Must be worth two or three mil. But nothing he can't afford as a partner in that fancy law firm. The man known as Matt Murdock, Daredevil, the man with no fear, was currently resting his tired body, still in his red spandex, after his night of patrolling Hell's Kitchen in the freezing New York weather. Murdock's been blind since he was 12 years old, but don't feel sorry for him or anything. He can hear, smell, taste and touch better than anyone else on the planet. But as he was sleeping blissfully unaware, someone was coming, someone was coming to get him. Black Widow said he could hear a pin drop from a mile away and she wasn't smiling, either. A pin from a block away, your breath from a mile away. That's how careful we must be as we slip into this way too tidy place he loves with all his heart. Quieter than a pin dropping. His unseeing eyes opened in the last moment, just for a gloved fist to be pressed hard in his left cheek. Where's your bodyguards, Murdoch? taunted Wolverine as he pressed his fist even harder into the side of Matt's face. Shield figures were only after super creeps with big noisy powers. The room and hallway connected to it were filled with hand assassins in a second. Well they're wrong, bub. Crazy wrong. He, 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 the hand's been after you for a long, long time Matty. Continued Wolverine as he lifted Matt in a sitting position, still bent over him, his closed fists pressed into his face. I understand you're a religious man, Murdoch. Normally. I'd be nice and let you whisper a prayer before I pop my claws into your face Matty boy, snicked. But I'm not really nice these days. Years have they been after him. Not that S.H.I.E.L.D. would care, he doesn't fly, he doesn't shoot plasma beams. Possess no real risk to national security. But Murdoch's quite a target for the hand, and the perfect little choice I have in mind. Beautiful, the words slipped out of her mouth as she aimed the crosshair of her rifle into the side of Wolverine's head. McGurk. I want you to call Nick Fury and tell him the plan is a go. She said to the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents behind her. What's happening, Miss Nachios? Asked McGurk as he took out his radio and dialed the correct frequency. Wolverine just swallowed the bait. Replied Electra as her right index finger squeezed the trigger. The hell! Exclaimed Wolverine as a bullet flew right in front of his nose and shot two of the hand's ninjas in the faces, one after the other. He jumped back just a little an involuntary reaction of his body due to the shock. This was all that Daredevil needed. Get out of my house, Wolverine, he exclaimed as he moved his legs under the Canadian's stomach and kicked out, sending the shorter man crashing into a wall. Though that wasn't very comforting for Daredevil since there were a dozen hand ninjas aiming bows at him. Floosh. But in a shower of red light, his relief came as Captain America, DX and X-23 teleported right behind the gathered assassins with only one thing on their minds. The zombie ninjas were quickly hacked to pieces. They have no pulse or heartbeat. Commented X-23 as she drove her right hand into an incoming enemy's gut, claws extended. They're no more alive than a side of beef. Exclaimed Daredevil as he grabbed one of his assailants' katanas and joined the fray. Soon his apartment was painted green with the blood of undead assassins. Outside. What the hell, muttered Electra as she watched the front of her rifle fall off, the cut was so fast that the metal was glowing red with heat. You don't have to say it out loud Electra, I know what you're thinking. 
A slightly Japanese accented voice came from her left where a man dressed in a red business suit stood holding a pair of katanas in each hand. How did I miss the shot? I haven't missed a shot in five years. His waist long black hair whipped around in the wind and his high cheek boned, gray skinned face. Not since the wind changed that time in Budapest and that big, fat, ugly drug kingpin took a bullet in his left eye, when I was aiming for the right. My name is the Gorgon, in case you were wondering. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. The man said as a little moonlight reflected off his glasses. Electra on the other hand didn't hesitate and took out her SMG which she tried to empty into Gorgon's torso, emphasis on trying as he danced around the bullets and hacked four of the shield agents to pieces. I am afraid I have some bad news Ms. Nachios, taunted Gorgon as he slowly advanced on the group. Fire. They would have none of that, or that is what they thought as he began to spin his swords, deflecting every single bullet sent his way and then skewered the two nearest agents. Shield is guarding 85 different masks right now and focusing on the super people who can take down buildings. With a single slice he cut through Electra's SMG and jumped back. Close your eyes for a moment. He warned as he took off his glasses to reveal his green glowing eyes. No, shouted Electra as she quickly turned around, the two surviving agents beside her were not that lucky and were turned to stone in an instant. We know how they are paying you to stop Wolverine and find out nests, but only a fool would believe money was your only motivation. Gorgon put his glasses back on and looked at Electra straight in the eye. You have a certain, history with the hand as well as Hydra. And so you feel you have some unfinished business to settle with your enemies. Then he did the weirdest thing. He threw one of his katanas behind him and launched the other at Electra who caught the coming blade in one swift motion. So why not settle it now? He opened his arms wide, indicating he was holding no weapons, inviting her to attack. Inside Murdoch's apartment, hey, what are you kids doing here? Taunted Wolverine as DX and X-23 circled him like the two predators they were. This is way over your heads, but I'm sure the guys at Hydra won't mind if I bring you two along for the ride. In an instant he brought his claws up, one arm in front of his heart and the other behind his neck. The first stopping DX's right hand wrist blades, while the second was stopping the third, special claw that shot out from the blonde's left wrist, from embedding into the back of his head. Kid, I've fought Quicksilver too many times for the super speed trick to work on me. Wolverine grinned as he kneed DX in the stomach, sending him back a few meters with a grunt. Acting on instinct, Wolverine jumped back and high to avoid the low tackle X-23 was about to connect with, though she was still able to nick him. You, ain't slow either kid. Guess it's all in the genes, he he. He laughed as both teens stood up, side by side and stared at the older man. You, ain't much for words or ya. You talk too much. Whispered DX as he launched himself once more, closely followed by X-23. The blonde reached Wolverine first and locked claws. The older man's strength came into play as he tried to push the teen back but unexpectedly, DX bended backwards, allowing X-23 to connect with a mid-air leg split. Foot claws extended, right across Wolverine's chest. Arg! That's it! I'm gonna gut both of ya! He shouted in rage as he rushed forward, shoulder tackling DX to the ground and raking his claws over the teen's chest, making him shout in pain. Wolverine, however, even filled with rage, wasn't stupid or ignorant of his surroundings. He quickly jumped forward and evaded X-23's attack. The girl quickly following back with a heel strike intended for his exposed back which he jumped over and delivered a roundhouse kick of his own to the girl's face in midair, sending her crashing to the floor. His moment of triumph however was short as DX quickly rushed forward and just as he was about to lock claws with Wolverine for the third time, he used a burst of speed to peer behind him and rake his claws across his back several times before jumping back to avoid the older man's retaliation. This is really getting damn annoying exclaimed Wolverine as he tried to claw X-23 who had just stabbed him in the kidney, both of them, while his back was turned. He couldn't take this for much longer, he knew that the hand ninjas were no match for Daredevil and with Captain America helping the man with no fear. They were gonna go down in half the time. Not to mention that the brats weren't going down either, and why should they be? They had his healing factor after all, well one of them, the other ones was even better. So now he was in a tough bind, whack, Scratch that, he was in an even tougher bind, since one of DD's billy clubs smacked him across the face. 
At that moment he knew that Daredevil and Cap had just finished off the last of the hand's goons, it was four on one now. Nice. Commented Gorgon as he ducked Electra's strike which took a big chunk of the chimney behind the Japanese mutant. Even better than I expected. He continued to taunt as he sidestepped another strike. He ducked left and right, sidestepped and finally jumped over her horizontal slash. This has been most amusing, Electra. But time is running out, and just like that, he grabbed Electra's sword hand and brought the sword to his moth, taking a big bite of it and breaking it in three pieces in the process, before kicking the raven haired woman in the gut with a lot of force. Our agent Wolverine may or may have not taken down Matt Murdock, but it really does not matter. He hit her with a straight right to the kidney. The Baroness is pleased with our progress today. He brought his hand down on her elbow, heavily. You should hear what she whispers in my earpiece, Electra. She has been watching your humiliation with her bald, useless husband and promises me Hydra if he fails in this last, great endeavor. The clothesline he delivered to her neck took her down and she began to cough in an attempt to breathe some air. Oh, and you know what that means, don't you? It means we are using what we stole from Reed Richards and make man as free as the day he was born. He pulled her up by her hair so she could look at him in the eyes. That means we won't have to be God's slaves anymore. He finished as he delivered a devastating right hook to her face which knocked her out cold, it was over. Get me out of here, hello? Is anyone there? A look of confusion quickly played itself across Wolverine's face, why weren't the bastards using the space jump to port him out of there? Gorgon should have been done by now. What are you waiting for? Get me out of here, no luck, Hydra was not answering. Something wrong Wolverine? Asked DX with a small smile as he, X-23, Cap and DD made a circle around him. What you do to me, Brad? The Canadian shouted in rage. Didn't you notice? asked X23 as she switched on the lights and lifted her claws so he could see that they were black. Poison? You poisoned me? snarled the Wolverine. Not poison per se, more like blocking Hydra's little enhancements with nanites engineered to not be attacked by our healing factor. Explained the raven haired girl as she grinned at him with an evil glint in her eyes. Why you little, it's over Wolverine, give up, you failed, shouted Daredevil as he pointed one of his billy clubs at him. Hey, did you really think you were the target Matty boy? He grinned broadly, making the others tense. Acting on a hunch, Cap pressed his earpiece and spoke loudly. Electra. Electra come in, anyone out there, respond. His hunch was right and he slowly turned to face the grinning Canadian with a frown chiseled, as if from stone, onto his face. Good thing we added a paralyzing agent into the mix, otherwise this would have gone for a long time. DX's voice suddenly broke the silence and made Wolverine's eyes widen as Cap reared his arm back and let his shield fly. He wanted to move, he really, really wanted to just crouch low or roll to the side, but his body suddenly decided to not comply and the flying disc nailed him right between the eyes, sending the brainwashed assassin flying back right into a pile of 20 kilograms weights. Healing factor or not, Logan's brain was mush right about now. Quickly go! Cap shouted as he turned in DX's direction only to find that he had already disappeared in a burst of speed and out of the now broken window, landing one all fours on the wall not that unlike NYC's resident webhead. Using only his arms, the blonde quickly climbed the wall and jumped over the edge just to see a man in a red suit with waist-long black hair load Electra onto a small flying vehicle which was manned by only one Hydra agent. Go! exclaimed Gorgon as he jumped on the speeded which quickly took off with DX in hot pursuit over the rooftops. Hard! shouted the blonde as he used his speed to jump over the edge and land on the edge of the speeder which had just picked up speed and was now racing over New York's sky. Sorry, this flight has been fully booked, said Gorgon as he looked over the edge straight into DX's eyes and tore the blonde's goggles right off his face since he was using both his hands to keep from falling off the flying vehicle due to its high speed. Happy landing! whispered the man as he took of his glasses and locked eyes with DX. RGHH! His powers kicked into high gear on their own as he fell dozens of feet to the cold concrete bellow. Crunch! Though he first made contact with the ledge of a ten-story apartment building before falling face first onto the ground with a loud, thud. Mew ust, get TT, to, safe, safe, he mumbled as he used his miraculously good left arm to reach into the metal container on the back of his waist and pulled out a red crystal which activated immediately on contact due to all the power he was releasing. 
Shield Helicarier. Will someone say something damn it? exclaimed Colonel Nick Fury, director of Shield into his earpiece as he attempted to get a status report from the ground team he had sent into Hell's Kitchen. Floosh. Suddenly a red light bathed the entire communication room. Quickly turning around, Nick's eye widened as he saw the battered and broken body of DX shining red and mending itself in front of his eyes. What the hell? Someone get a medic here, right now. He quickly rushed to the teen and rolled him over only to recoil as he saw his eyes, his gray, stone eyes. Jesus, what happened? Later, pull them out, now, DX breathed heavily as he coughed some blood that had flooded his quickly mending lungs. Take it easy, kid, medics are on their way. Fury tried to calm him down but the blonde would have none of it. My healing factor is going in super drive. Pull them out, now, please. Fury hesitated for another second before clenching his teeth tightly. Get over here and hold him down. In a second there were at least five other people holding DX to the floor as Fury reached to his right boot and pulled out his combat knife. Jesus, he muttered again as he plunged the knife into the blonde's right eye socket. Hidden Hydra Facility. The ring, please, Wolfgang. The light in the room was dim, only a single light bulb shone over the two elder people. Elsbeth, I. Wolfgang. Darling. Don't embarrass yourself. Not in front of the others. Muttered Elsbeth von Strucker to her husband. Yes, of course. I'm sorry Elsbeth. Replied Wolfgang von Strucker as he took off his wedding ring. Just ask them to remember my achievements too. E.H. And make sure Electra succeeds where my other grand schemes hit the skids. That's all I ask. Oh, she'll succeed, my love. Gorgon has such nice plans for Electra comforted him his wife. Hail Hydra. Immortal Hydra. We shall never be destroyed. Cut off a limb and two more shall take its place. Shouted several of the figures dressed in the typical Hydra green clothes. We serve none but the master and the world will soon be ours. Von Strucker got on his knees as took of his glasses, bowing his head. Hail Hydra, he muttered as Gorgon raised his katana high. Several hours after Hell's kitchen rumble. Shield Helicarrier. What are they doing to him down there anyway? said Cap as he stood in front of a one way mirror, situated above a laboratory where Wolverine was strapped tightly to a table. A lot of machines and tubes were connected to his head, keeping him sedated. What else can we do? There was talk about killing him, but it ain't his fault. That and he has info on Hydra's plans. Makes sense we poke around his head and see if we can find anything useful, answered Nick Fury, who stood at Cap's right arms crossed over his chest. Poor guy, never gets a break, how's the kid? Pulled both his stone eyefied eyes out of his skull, his healing factor was going so fast that the new eyes came out not a second after I pulled the useless ones, he's fine now, kid's a freaking nuclear power station, you can't keep him down. He and the girl are either in the mess or in one of the training rooms, tearing up the place, Fury sighed deeply. What's the matter, Nick? This was the easy part. This is what happens when the moderates are in control, now when the lunatics are in charge, what the hell is gonna happen now? I'm afraid to ask, mumbled Cap. You got a plan? He looked up to stare at Fury's only good eye. Nah, no plan yet. But I guess we have something better than a plan. What's that? We still got three aces to Hydra's one in the little killing machine department, finished Fury with a face set in stone, mimicked by Cap. The end. Now we will see you I in the next video.